Okay, sergeants, if you would begin your recordings. Okay, so the recording is up. Cloud recording is underway. Backup okay. is rolling. Sergeant Jones, please take us away. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing on the Committee of Sanitation and Solid Waste Management. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their videos. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices to vibrate or silent. And if you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. And again, that is testimony at council.nyc.gov. And thank you for your cooperation. And Chair, we are ready to begin. Thank you. I guess I'm using my, my bike pump as my gavel for the day. <laughs> Thank you all for being here today. I'm sorry. My name is uh, Council Member Antonio Reynoso. I want to start off by just recognizing that we've been joined by Council Members Chin, uh, Council Member Constantinides, uh, Council, Council, uh, Council Member Moya, Council Member Cabrera, uh, and Council Member Chin. I don't know if I said Council Member Chin, and our newest Council Member. Council Member Gennaro, it's a pleasure to have you here, sir. Um, we love all the council members, but the new ones always got a little more love, you know? Uh, so thank you so much for being here. Uh, I am the chair of the Committee on Sanitation and Solid Waste Management. Today, we will hear from the Department of Sanitation on its fiscal 2020 preliminary budget, which totals $1.74 billion. This is a $32.1 million less than fiscal year 2021 adopted budget of $1.77 billion. I want to begin today's hearing by thanking our sanitation workers for the incredible sacrifices they have made on behalf of our city over the past year. These workers, who very rarely receive any accolades bestowed upon them, bestowed upon other uniformed agencies, are absolutely essential to the health and safety of our city and threw themselves selflessly into this work in the face of a pandemic that we know that we knew very little about at the time. Sanitation workers faced an uphill battle with lack of sufficient PPE, had inconsistent health guidelines, and received zero compensation for working in harm's way. The city will never be able to repay the debt we owe these workers, but I think there's a lot more we can be doing, and I'm calling on the mayor and governor again to compensate our frontline workers for the sacrifices during the pandemic. I, along with many New Yorkers, am deeply disappointed in the sanitation services of our, that our city has received over the past year. It's impossible to look at our streets and say we're delivering the services residents have come to expect. I wanna be clear though, this is not the fault of DSNY and I wanna commend Commissioner Grayson for stepping into the breach under very difficult circumstances. The mayor and his, and his, team, and his team counselors saw fit to level, to level cuts, I apologize, to level cuts in the previous fiscal year so drastic, it led Commissioner Garcia, one of our best public servants to resign in protest. And these cuts were not just to one area of the department's work, but gutted both the basic cleaning services critical to making our city a livable place, as well as the environmental programs that are essential to combating climate change. We've now had a year to assess the impact of these cuts and reflect on whether this is the direction we want our city to take. I expect there are very few New Yorkers who believe we should continue along the path. And yet today we're presented with a preliminary budget that barely moves the needle in addressing our filthy streets or getting serious about the dangerous impact of our current waste system that our current waste system has on the environment. The mayor is continuing to reduce headcount using budget tricks to outsource work that is currently being done by unionized sanitation workers to private low wage employers. This is not sustainable and we should not all be outraged that our leaders have left our city in such a poor state. This budget does not reflect the council's priorities or those of many New Yorkers. Furthermore, it does nothing to move us towards the mayor's own goal of diverting zero waste to landfills by 2030. Our leaders simultaneously pay lip service to climate change being the greatest crisis of our time while cutting the very programs that would address it, undermining public trust and allowing the crisis to deepen. New Yorkers have stepped up through, 
Though I want to applaud the many community organizations and volunteers who have sprung into action to help close the gap. These efforts are receiving very little support from the city and are not a long-term solution for handling the waste, the waste of eight and a half million people. I look forward to having a discussion with you today, Commissioner, and I hope you can give us an honest assessment of the resources DSNY needs to keep our streets clean while implementing the sustainability programs that will help us achieve a green waste processing system in New York City. I will now turn it over to our committee council to go over some procedural items and swear in the witnesses. And then we'll hear testimony from DSNY. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Nicole Levine, Council of the City Council's Committee on Sanitation and Solid Waste Management. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify, at which point you will be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called, as I will periodically announce who the next panelist will be. We will first hear testimony from the administration, which will be followed by questions from the council members, followed by testimony from members of the public. I will now administer the oath to Commissioner Grayson, First Deputy Commissioner Salvatore Sorolla, and Deputy Commissioner Gregory Anderson. Please raise your right hands. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief, and that you will answer council member questions honestly? Commissioner Grayson? I do. Thank you. First Deputy Commissioner Sorolo? I do. Thank you. And Deputy Commissioner Anderson? I do. Thank you. Um, you may begin when ready. And just before we begin, I want to acknowledge that we've been joined by Council Members Riley and Council Member Deutsch. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, good morning. I've been here a long time. I'm sorry. Good afternoon, Chairman Reynoso and members of the City Council Committee on the Sanitation and Solid Waste Management. I'm Edward Grayson, Commissioner of the New York City's Department of Sanitation, and I thank you for the opportunity to discuss the department's portion of the mayor's fiscal year 2022. I'm sorry. Uh, fiscal year 2022 preliminary budget and the fiscal year 2021 preliminary mayor's management report and our current programs and operations. With, this, with me this afternoon are First Deputy Commissioner Salvatore Cerullo and Gregory Anderson, the Deputy Commissioner for Policy and External Affairs. I'm pleased to be here in front of the committee for the first time in my formal appointment as commissioner since the end of December. This month marks one year since New York City became the epicenter of the worst public health crisis our nation has faced in more than a century. The COVID-19 crisis has taken a devastating toll on our families, our communities, and upended everyday life. Sadly, like many agencies and partners in government, the department has also been personally affected by this terrible illness. Since our first case nearly one year ago, we have lost eight employees who had confirmed COVID-19 cases. Nearly 20% of the Department of Sanitation's employees have tested positive for the virus, and hundreds more were out sick last March and April before widespread testing was available. We continue to advocate with the state to open up access to COVID-19 vaccines for all of our frontline essential sanitation employees who have demonstrated their dedication and resolve over this very difficult year. Our prim preliminary FY22 budget. While we are still in an unprecedented and uncertain fiscal time, the proposed FY22 department preliminary budget will ensure that the department can continue its core operations necessary to keep New York City healthy, safe, and clean. The preliminary budget includes $1.739 billion in expense funds for the department. Our FY22 budget, budgeted headcount is 9,503 employees, which includes 7,381 full-time uniform and 2,122 full-time civilian positions. In addition, the department's proposed FY22 capital budget is $184.7 million. Of this amount, $131.8 million is allocated to facility construction and rehabilitation, $8.3 million for information and technology projects, and $44.6 million to replace equipment and vehicles. Together, the November plan and the preliminary budget include almost $44 million in savings for fiscal years 21 and 22, including $18.6 million due to the continued suspension of curbside organics 
for FY22. 13.2 million in lower projected costs for the Fresh Kills landfill closure and post-closure maintenance. 4.4 million in additional revenue from the sale of environmental, et environmental attributes associated with Fresh Kills landfill gas. 4 million from the privatization of Sunday and Holly security off facilities and 1.9 million to the reduced street sweeping frequency associated with alternate side parking. While the vaccine does offer a light at the end of the tunnel for the COVID-19 crisis, the financial toll on our city is far from over. The cuts that we have taken over this last year and will continue to take in the future have required tough choices and we do not take them lightly. However, I am pleased to report that the FY22 preliminary budget includes funding from some programs that help us make progress towards the zero waste goals including 2.2 million to reinstate our special waste sites and safe disposal events, and a full 3.5 million for our New York City Compost Project partners. I would like to take this opportunity to thank Chair Rosso and many of you for your leadership and efforts this last summer to restore funding for community composting and food scrap drop-off sites. Snow fighting is a core component for the department's mission. And this critical work has come front and center this winter. National Weather Service observations in Central Park measure 26 inches in February alone, the eighth snowiest February in New York City recorded history. In total, we have activated for 12 winter weather events and received a total of almost 39 inches of snow so far for this season. And there's still a few weeks of winter left. I am proud of the dedication, resilience, and perseverance that our workforce has shown working long hours on split shifts for more than three straight weeks. Our employees and their families are true public servants. We know that every snowstorm brings its unique challenges, yet despite our headcount reduction this winter season, I believe the men and women in this department, as always, have rose to the occasion during each of these snow events to ensure our streets remain safe and passable. I know the tough and often brutal conditions they face each storm, having been out there myself earlier in my career, and I cannot thank them enough for their service. To date, this winter season, the department has used over 450,000 tons of road salt, 520,000 gallons of calcium chloride, and 202,000 gallons of liquid brine to de-ice the city's roadways. We also have about 217,000 tons of road salt on hand at our 43 sites citywide and contracts in place to deliver an, an additional 279,000 tons if necessary. While we hope that we are out of the woods for the remainder of the season, we remain ready to fight whatever mother nature gives us for the rest of March. The current FY21 snow budget is $1.14 million, uh, $101.4 million, I apologize. And the preliminary FY22 snow budget is $89.9 million. At, at the cornerstone of the city's long-term solid waste management plan, the city's comprehensive is, is our solid waste management plan. It calls for the creation of eight rail or barge base transfer stations together with the use of existing energy from waste facility in New Jersey that shifts waste export, export from long haul trucking to a sustainable and reliable network of marine and rail transfer stations equitably distributed throughout the five boroughs. Today, all nine long-term facilities are fully operational and the plan has reduced truck traffic associated with waste transport by more than 60 million miles per year including more than 5 million miles in and around New York City. It has slashed greenhouse gas emissions associated with waste transport by more than 34,000 tons annually, and has created a more equitable distribution of waste management infrastructure in New York City. These nine facilities also create new waste transfer capacity that has allowed the city to permanently reduce permitted capacity of privately operated transfer stations in historically overburdened and minority communities predominantly located in three neighborhoods in Brooklyn North, Southeastern Queens, and the South Bronx. In accordance with Local Law 152 of 2018, New York City's Waste Equity Law, the department implemented reductions in its permanent capacity at 22 transfer stations in overburdened communities in the 12 month period ending September 30th, 2020. The reductions implemented pursuant to this law cut permitted capacity in these communities by over 10,000 tons per day. The commercial waste sector also plays an important role in achieving our zero waste goals. Commercial waste zones will create a safe and efficient collection system for commercial waste that provides high quality, low cost service to New York City businesses 
while advancing the city's zero waste and sustainability goals. The new system is expected to reduce commercial waste truck traffic by more than 50%, eliminate millions of miles of truck traffic, cutting air pollution and reducing the, the time it takes for workers to complete their routes. It is also expected to nearly double the commercial diversion rate for recyclables and organic, and organic waste. The impact of the current COVID-19 crisis on our city's businesses has dramatically affected their private carting industry. And we believe that the business community and the carting industry must begin to recover and stabilize before embarking on this transformative effort. Nonetheless, the department remains firmly committed to implementing this program and fully realizing its benefits for all New Yorkers. So we must take the right precautions to do so sensibly. Following a six month delay due to the pandemic, the department began the competitive process procurement, uh, the procurement process by issuing part one of a request for proposals in November of 2020. Part one of the RFP requested information from potential awardees to determine their ability to perform in accordance with specific business, character, financial, and licensing requirements. Submissions for part one were received by February 19th of 2021. This spring is promulgating several rules to implement the program, including rules governing customer service, operations, health and safety, recycling and organics collection, and other administrative requirements. By late spring, the department will also issue part two of the RFP to the select zone awardees. We anticipate the transition period to the new zone system to begin in 2022 and last up to two years. Before the COVID pandemic crisis, an estimated 1.2 million New Yorkers faced food insecurity. However, due to, yet to the economic devastation caused by COVID-19, we estimate that this number has grown to over 2 million before stabilizing around 1.6 million as the city began to reopen. One year later, as families continue to struggle to make ends meet, many New Yorkers, especially our older neighbors and those with health conditions, remain stuck inside their homes and apartments unable to safely shop at their neighborhood supermarket or eat meals in group settings. They deserve the dignity of knowing where their next meal will come from. Last March, at the request of, the May of Mayor de Blasio, the department was tasked with leading an interagency team dedicated to keeping our city fed and safeguarding the food supply chain during the public health emergency. Many of those programs continue to operate under the leadership of the Mayor's Office of Food Policy. DSNY continues to operate the Get Food NYC emergency home feeding delivery program to deliver meals directly to New Yorkers who need them, cannot leave their home due to the pandemic, and cannot afford private delivery options. Many of our colleagues at the department stepped up to support the effort to feed New Yorkers in this past year, including recycling outreach staff, attorneys, contract specialists, and our operations managers. I'm incredibly proud of their efforts and what they're able to do. Through the emergency programs established to date, the city has distributed more than 200 million meals to hungry New Yorkers through the emergency home food delivery program alone. DSNY has delivered 125 million meals. The department is currently funded for $366 million for emergency feeding initiatives in FY 2021. We will continue to work with the mayor's office, our partner agencies at OMB and others as necessary to assess the costs associated with this effort and ensure that adequate funding is available to provide food for those in need during this crisis. Throughout the crisis, the department has continued to provide essential trash and recycling collection services for millions of New Yorkers. This is a testament to the dedication and commitment of our sanitation workers, uniformed officers, tradesmen and women, and the other essential staff. We all owe the hardworking employees of the department and all other essential workers a debt of gratitude for their efforts during the past 12 months. They are New York's pandemic heroes. In closing, I wish to thank Chairman Reynoso and other members of this committee, as well as other members of the council for continuing to support our essential workers, the programs and the work. You are critical advocates as we work to keep New York City healthy, safe and clean. And I thank you for this opportunity to testify this afternoon. And my staff and I are now happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Commissioner Grayson. I'm going to ask uh, a few questions uh, to give time for my colleagues um, so they won't have to sit here for a couple of hours. Um, I can do that. Uh, 
The department has reduced its uniform headcount considerably over the past year. With cuts to core services, including litter basket service, lot cleaning, organic material collection, e-waste collection, and others. This leaves DSNY with only 7,381 uniform budget positions as of preliminary plan. Are other agencies, especially uniform agencies, taking such a large headcount, such large headcount cuts like sanitation? How do you compare our cuts to the rest of the uniformed agencies, Commissioner Grayson? Thank you, Chair. I appreciate the question. Um, we have definitely saw the headcount reduction, and I know, and you're ver fully versed in where those uh, services were reduced that corresponded with those headcount reductions. Um, at this point in time, I couldn't tell you how we are in comparison to other large agencies and uniform headcount agencies, as I'm not fully familiar with all of their programmatic needs. But I can tell you that the cuts that we have seen that you've referenced are still in place, and we are trying to build a plan to adapt to that headcount moving forward. And are we going to get a, a new academy class? Are we looking to hire, uh, uh, hire our headcount, um, I guess, at this point, Commissioner Grayson? Um, I'm still working with, and so is my team, we're working with OMB uh, on the timing of classes and the feasibility of classes and the reality of the budget. Uh, that's why we, it's good to have these hearings. It's good to, to air all this out. At this point in time, we're still working with the administration to figure out what services we are still moving forward with and what a hiring programmatic will be. I can tell you that from the department's purview, we are definitely interested in the hiring and the process of hiring as we work with external challenges, such as our employees, our frontline workers, our sanitation workers, our critical service providers who are the first line of defense. They all uh, need commercial driver's licenses. And part of our hiring process is being able to train them. And given uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, while we have a robust training potential, uh, we still have to work around with our state partners at the DMV to get everybody a license. So these are all discussions that are going on and we're working with timing, but definitely as we move forward with the administration and with OMB's input, we will definitely get you that information once I have it. I'm not trying to be aloof. I just, mm -hmm. I'm trying to work through some logistical challenges and work with the administration on the realities of the budget. Thank you, thank you for that. Look, we, we see the city at this point, Commissioner, and we're extremely concerned uh, we now know that there's some cleanliness indicators that showed a significant decrease compared to the same period in fiscal year 2020. Uh, with indicators pointing to a decline in cleanliness ratings, how is it that the department is able to propose further cleaning reductions to street sweeping? Um, so I just want to like really understand how an already, you know, uh, a situation that it's not in a good place can be, you know, we're going to extend that or we're going to do more um, and I actually have people in my district asking to go back to four days, right? To go back to the original, um, and who would have thunk it that alternate side of the street parking would be uh, something that folks are clamoring to get back because our streets are so dirty. But in this uh, proposal, there seems to be even more cuts to it. Can you, can you explain that? Yeah, that's a great point. And I thank you for bringing it up. And right now we have this, uh, we are doing the reduced uh, alternate side parking. And like you said, Chair, uh, totally interesting observation that in the course of the confluence of what's going on with the city's response to COVID, how uh, something that I know myself moving my car two times a week, you know, when I used to park in Queens um, was always annoying. And yet now we're clamoring, a lot of, a lot of communities are clamoring to get more sweeping back because we're down to the one time a week. Because now we see that we recognize the importance of street sweeping, of being out there on a proactive cleaning program. That coupled with the reduction in litter basket service. So that's one of the challenges. One of the challenges is, is that right now, it is a myriad of a confluence of circumstances between the litter basket collection, the reduced ASP that was done as a COVID precaution to give people the opportunity to limit their exposure to public. So we are still working to try to find out where we're going to land. There is an active, uh, a real active search to find out how we will uh, adjust ASP citywide. There are clearly, while you're 100% right, the scorecard indicators have decreased in a lot of places in the city. There are other areas of the city where the frequency of sweeping that exceeded one time, we can honestly take an open look at and say, 
perhaps it was able to sustain, to sustain itself. I also think, Chair, that it is of note to notice about general cleanliness, definitely what would easily be considered a true and, 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 and reality check is the makeup of what is now visible litter. Sadly, like many of the constituents you represent and many of the city that you represent, who are talking to your fellow uh, colleagues at the council and to us and, and our community partners, um, one of the other things that's happened is the way the litter stream has also changed to now sometimes include PPE, masks and gloves, which is definitely going to take even the most uh, consummate New Yorker who may or may not be able to walk past what would be a top of a coffee cup in the curb line. But for automatically, when you see a mask or a set of gloves someone on the floor, you actually naturally become hyper aware given what we've all been through in the COVID pandemic. That doesn't mean, what do I wanna do? I understand that we have to look together to what we're gonna do with sweeping. But for right now, that reduction in sweeping, which then does cascade to a reduction, sadly, on the headcount sign, as you, as you, as you pointed out, uh, we have to assume that for the start of the budget, as we're planning, that that, that restriction that is there for a safety-based COVID limit people's reality of leaving their homes while we're still trying to get safe, we're leaving it in place. We're still working with, with everyone, yourself included, to try to get to what the finalization of that is. But for right now, we're assuming that we're only going to remain on the one time a week. And in a tough decision budget, we're leaving it in right now as a proposal on how we would move forward, clearly looking for more input with all the stakeholders, because we agree with you. We've certainly seen scorecard come down and everyone can look around the city. And certainly we're having real discussions on where we'll go with street cleaning and sweeping in general. Uh, it, it's just, uh, you know, I, I hear what you're saying. You have limited resources. Um, and, you know, the alternate side of the street parking reduction was done, again, as a safety measure to make sure that we're keeping our community secure. But with the news coming down from the federal government that everyone that wants to be vaccinated will have the opportunity to be vaccinated by May, makes it so that starting July 1st, uh, we won't necessarily need to keep people in their homes as a safety precaution. Um, and because we no longer need to keep them in their homes out of safety, we should assume or resume business as usual when it comes to the cleanliness of our streets. And at this point, for that not to be in the budget, it's a, it's a huge problem, Commissioner Grayson. So I'm just going to be very clear that I think it's unacceptable that this city would even consider maintaining only one day a week um, uh, or this reduced Streets, uh, street sweeping service um, when we're moving into the next budget. At this point, I feel like they're, they're okay with a dirty city so long as they're saving a couple of bucks. And that's just not, that doesn't sit well with me. So I will be uh, fighting through the budget negotiating team and, and with you and the mayor's office to try to reinstate ASP um, that existed before. And look, if you have some places that do you think the reduction is actually working and the cleanliness is being maintained? Then absolutely, you could, you could do away with those. But in the district that I represent um, and many council members that are actually on this Zoom, they are letting me know very clearly that their streets are dirty and they need more street sweeping to happen. Uh, so just wanna make sure that you're aware of, of uh, you know, the discussions that I'm looking to have with you moving forward. Um, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Uh, the mayor announced that he would be launching an initiative to bolster street and sidewalk cleanliness. With, and, you know, which kind of, you know, it's just backtracking. The mayor cuts this, the budget significantly and then finds money. Um, and I don't know where he found money, but finds money and decided, decides to give it to the Department of Sanitation because he sees that the city got out of control or the cleanliness was out of control. And then it's clear that this is a money issue. It's a resource issue um, and not an effort issue. I know you're doing more with less Commissioner and I, and I want to thank you and applaud you for the work that you're doing and the, you know, the sanitation workers as well, but we're, we're, it's a reality. This initiative, what did it do? Where did it go? Did it actually help? Um, or are we just putting a Band-Aid on a bigger problem here? Um, Chair, you're not, uh, just to be clear, the, the initiative we're talking about, is that the, what he said at the State of the City with the expanded yeah. funding for the 10,000? Um, and po possibly bringing on additional community-based resources? Uh, let me see. Uh, uh, I just want to make sure I'm in. Council, or, or so Jonathan and Nicole, which uh, the initiative I'm talking about was uh, midway through the, the year, the commission, the, the mayor brought up 
uh, an initiative that he was going to implement to, uh, to address this issue of cleanliness in our city. Uh, Am I right? Okay, thank you. Okay, I got you. I got you, Chairman. Right. Okay, thanks. so that that mid year, um, that midway restoration was for us, for DSNY, was uh, re the restoration of a, a set number of basket trucks that had been restored that had been previously cut. Right. Uh, and 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 the last time and when we spoke last at the you know the last time you chaired this committee together to talk about street cleanliness issues, uh, we. In that, we talked about how those basket trucks had been put back to the places that were heavily targeted uh, at that time by COVID-19, and that we were looking at the metrics on street cleanliness um, and in that in that service restoration. There was also a component of that to engage community-based organizations to potentially come out and help with street cleaning. Um, to the effect that that happened, we have not coordinated that effort. And as you know well from the feedback of your of your colleagues, um, we have we've been able to restore that basket service. And every community board that we that we worked in um, certainly appreciated it. We've been talking to our local stakeholders, and we would like to continue that service uh, throughout. And so far, we plan to. Uh, that's part of what we've submitted in this plan. Uh, we would definitely look to expand basket service if there's any way that funding could. And we, we're continuing to work on what funding will become available. Um, to, to do that, but as far as the, the, the community-based cleaning that would come in through private organizations, um, that has not materialized for us, so I cannot give you a metric on that. So um, I'm going to allow for my colleagues to ask, ask questions. Now, I just want to end my, uh, my first round of questioning with uh, a dirty city is a public health crisis in itself. Uh, while I, I agree that we're dealing with COVID and we have to be very smart about how we're how we're budgeting, considering the crisis we're in. Uh, the Department of Sanitation should be one of the few departments that should have been spared, or uh, sh we should have had a, 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 more, a more nuanced conversation about how these cuts would work. Uh, just a reduction in service is not an appropriate, uh, an appropriate action during a public health crisis that can now bring about another public health crisis. Um, I'm, I'm very, I was, oh, I was disappointed with the cuts that the mayor was making because I thought they were just, uh, there was no, no review. There was a, it was just a slash uh, to, 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 to meet a goal as opposed to really understanding how our city moves and how our city operates. Uh, the Department of Sanitation has been doing a great job and it's because it's been well resourced. Once we start cutting that, we dive into a, a bigger problem. So uh, look, I'm looking forward to having a, a different type of conversation than last time. I think our, our budget is not as bad or is not projected to be as bad as they originally thought. And if money is coming in from the federal government, I wanna make sure the Department of Sanitation is front and center as one of the first agencies that gets all of their money restored, um, at least uh, into last year's, uh, uh, equivalent to last year's budget. So again, Commissioner Grayson, thank you for your time. I'm gonna ask more questions after my colleagues speak um, and I'm gonna allow for, um, uh, Council Bean, I think you're gonna you're gonna call through the council members. Yep. So I, I'll now call on council members in the order that they use the Thank Zoom you. raise hand function. Um, and so if you have questions, please use the Zoom raise hand function now. Each council member will have five minutes, and we'll start with Council Member Cabrera, followed by Council Member Chen. Council Member Cabrera. Starting time. Thank you so much, and thank you to the chair. Chair, thank you for your leadership, your passion, and all the years that I've uh, been serving in this committee. Uh, you never cease to carry the banner uh, for what is right in this committee. So thank you. Thank you so much. And Commissioner, congratulations on your first preliminary budget hearing. Uh, but it, it's in a bad time. Uh, and so <laughs> with that, I, <laughs> I feel for you. I, I also want to thank. Uh, our sanitation department workers. They did a phenomenal job in my district during uh, the snow. Uh, they came relentlessly, especially right here in the Bronx. But I wanna address uh, the issue of the assignment of work sanitation workers. Uh, do you happen to know how many sanitation workers we have assigned to the Bronx? Oh, well, let me get my... Uh, uh, yes, I will hold, just give me one second because I have a sheet here with the entire citywide breakdown. 
but in the we have a, I have a grid. Yes. Uh, hold on one second. And if if anything, I can uh, hold on one. Uh, Commissioner Anderson, do you have that grid easily in front of your desk? Actually, I have it. I'll say I'll spare you the time. I'm looking at it because so my time is clicking. The Bronx only has 764 workers. That's it. Compare to Manhattan that has 1,137. Staten Island, beautiful zone, they only have 105. 105, that's it. Queens has 1,651 plantation workers. In Brooklyn, 1,704. Here's my concern about the Bronx. Number one, we're very spread out, especially in the east side, in the mid, north, and the east side of the Bronx. It's not like Manhattan, where you can do quick pickups. So it's a lot easier to do pickups, as you know, you're a veteran, uh, as compared to the Bronx. And we are having our trucks go not once, but twice uh, out to do once they're full, twice by the same crew, which no other borough happens to have. And we have more tonnage. I don't know why, but we have more tonnage of garbage coming out of the Bronx than any other borough. So I'm just very confused when you have the tonnage, when you have this, the, the spread, it, 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 it takes them longer to do pickups. And we have so much fewer to the point that you know, like I know, then when we have snow taking place, that you're always gonna have to, you're always sending sanitation workers to come to the Bronx to be helped because there's not enough of them. And we're feeling the effects here in the Bronx. As a matter of fact, I have the news call me. Before I even call them, they call, they say, we noticed, because you know, they drive around here and there's news stories that have come out of this. Uh, and I, I like to understand why uh, do we have such a disparity? Uh, it's a very good question. I understand your point. So the uniform sanitation worker headcount um, is usually for years is deployed upon the number of daily truck assignments that we send out. Now we have had, we had an assignment, we had a nutrition reduction from the programs from last year that was through retirement. When the sanitation workers then retire, um, we are not in full control as to where they retire from. My point is, is that the headcount of totality assigned to the Bronx is not binary to the amount of trucks we can run in the Bronx. Because also throughout the department's history, what we do is we deploy sanitation workers assigned to other zones on a daily basis as needed into pickup refuse and recycling throughout the, all the five boroughs. I agree with you that the Bronx right now has a head count that it's had lower than before. Um, and if we get a chance to do some hiring, we may be able to fill those positions because that's where they've been attrited from. If we get built back up into a certain, and again, we're still working towards that. But your, what the, the observation you've made on the totality of head count is 100% correct. And just so you know, and I know that you're, you're, very, you're a big supporter of sanitation, and the men and women on sanitation in the Bronx. And I cannot thank you enough for that. I hear about it all the time. And I wanna tell you that we, the, the sanitation workers of the Bronx are some of the hardest workers that we have. The yeah. high density, the high density, just to touch on the tonnage, the high density in places like Western Bronx and, Manhattan and in Brooklyn North are why some of those districts do more than one loaded truck. It's not, it's just because of the high density of the area and they load up the truck and then they go offload it and come back. It is not a disparate way that we handle it. We handle it similarly in all high density areas and have been for my entire career. But I will agree with you, sir, wholeheartedly, hardworking men and women in the Bronx, and I totally understand your, 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 your point here today that when we get into a chance of reallocating resources and moving headcount around, that we should be looking at the Bronx. Totally understood. Mr. Chair, 30 seconds. Yeah, absolutely. Thank, Thank you me. so much. So. Uh, if there is high density, it would seem to me, and thank you, Commissioner, for acknowledging uh, that, that we're having difficulties here. But if we have a higher density, I would, it would seem to me that we should assign more trucks. 
I, I, I'm a little confused, and, and maybe the chair could explore this because he'll have the time. Why the NYPD, if they see they need more police officers, they're able to dispatch them and assign them on a permanent basis there. Why can't we do that when we see that there's such a great need here? And I'm with the chair that one of the last places we should be cutting, and we, we have to call attention to the administration, is with the sanitation workers. We need them. This three to one attrition is not gonna work with the sanitation department. And I know you're with me, and I know you can't say that out loud, but myself and the chair, and I know my colleagues will say that out loud and help you out in that respect, because uh, this, this is a health issue at the end of the day. This is, this, this, is, this is a concerning issue. It's a quality of life issue that many of our constituents are complaining. I never had so many complaints in all the years I live in the Bronx, since 1988, never had so many complaints about the garbage, uh, situation it's just bad and I know you just got in I'm sorry you have to carry now this leadership but you're it and so with that I run out of time thank you Mr. Chair I really appreciate the time thank you Commissioner thank you Councilman Cabrera if you have any other questions uh, we'll have a second round if necessary thank you thank, thank you. you really appreciate it now we hear from Councilmember Chen followed by Councilmember Brannon starting time Thank you. Uh, thank you to the chair and uh, thank you, Commissioner. Um, it's been a tough year and I really wanted to also uh, share, um, also thank all the sanitation workers. Uh, I am really glad to hear uh, the commercial zone. Uh, it's gonna move ahead, uh, even though it got delayed and um, that will really help in terms of, you know, many community, especially the district that I represent uh, with the uh, commercial carding company. Um, and the other good news that you share with us, and I'm glad to hear uh, the community composting, um, the money was you know, put back for that. I think that's really uh, important. Uh, personally, I see the difference because even for myself, uh, we have a composting site uh, at the Bowling Green uh, area near the subway. Every Tuesday morning, my husband bring, <laughs> bring out food scrap there. And it, it's really, you know, our garbage has lessened. And I think that's something that we would need to really spend more money on to really promote that kind of program across the city. Because a lot of the garbage is food garbage, food waste garbage. And we really got to work on that. And so that's something that we have to continue uh, to fight for more money. The other thing is that uh, that I agree with the chair is that there should not be a budget cut because the whole thing with collecting garbage, especially in certain area, um, like where I represent where the streets are very narrow, but the residential population is growing. So every day you walk by tons of garbage during garbage pickup day, the next day, and in the evening, the garbage are out. And with the recyclable, it takes up the whole block. And you know my constituents are asking for more pickup, but we have budget cuts. Uh, we you know we're just hopeful that it doesn't the the pickup time doesn't you know get less, but we definitely need more. And those programs are really um, important. And I see you know that we wanted to hire more worker. You're talking over the program if we can have more resources, but at the same time you're taking a hit uh, on your staff. Um, to do this work. And last, my last question is, why is Department of Sanitation taking care of emergency food program? I know, you know, Commissioner Garcia de Czar, she was in charge, so that's why your agency, you know, got involved. But that should not be your job, <laughs> right? You, you focus on what you do. Emergency food should be somewhere else. And I, I wanted to see, to hear from you, like how is that, you know, taking away from the work that, that you are supposed to be doing uh, to keep the city, you know, clean and, and healthy. And can I just uh, follow up with that? Uh, uh, Council Member Chin, 
a lot of the but this budget is being cut 33 million about 33 million this go around but a lot of that is it's a it's a funny numbers game because we're getting an increase in money for food work yeah right which is being attributed to the to the cut here or to the increase um, so in reality, there's a larger cut to sanitation services than we can even see that is being, um, is kind of, and, and not intentionally, but it's being hidden by the increase in the amount of money we're getting for the food work. So the Department of Sanitation budget is actually being cut a lot more. The service portion of it is being cut a lot more. So uh, Commissioner, if you could uh, answer those questions for Council Member Chin. Absolutely. And Councilmember Chen, I, I appreciate the question. Um, I'm going to start with the last one first and just say that why you're, you're right. First off, I am not the food czar. And <laughs> it's a great question. Um, what does the Department of Sanitation have to do with emergency food? Well, one thing I could say about this department and why they picked my predecessor to jump in is that this department has a longstanding history of emer standing up emergency responses and a great team of people who are very aware of contract procurement and working with the interagency team that came out of OEM to try to put this up very quickly. So in the wake of that, uh, and we couldn't be prouder of what they've been able to do when the over, like I said in my testimony, over 200 million meals delivered, um, we are, there is a path forward for the Department of Sanitation as the program realistically is you know, going to be taken over solely by the mayor's office of food policy. As it stands right now, we still have resources dedicated and contracts that are still ongoing DSNY managed into FY22, which is why we're still in play, but we continue to work with the mayor's office of food policy and we do see a path out. I want you to know that our frontline staff, the men and women uh, picking up garbage uh, and, and recyclables and plowing snow, at no time did they take their eye off the ball of what their core function was to deliver food. We did ancillary support with some of the frontline workers just with transporting and helping out. But for the most part, this was our incredible team of administrators, lawyers, contractors, the incredible staff of the recycling unit that we have in San who, who stepped in because the recycling programs had you know, scaled back with what was going on with the budget. And we can't thank them enough. And I think that that's why we're involved in food. And with regard to the extra putouts and the tonnage increases of COVID, you're 100% right. We saw tonnage go up. We saw people change their behavior at the curb and how they set it out, particularly as people had more deliveries or had more boxes to put out and stops got bigger. And the sidewalk space, particularly in your district, certainly becomes a scarcity on a collection day with all this extra material out. And I cannot think our workforce enough to try to step up. But I agree with you. We all have to look at the changing landscape with all this additional tonnage. When does that behavior normalize with a path forward in recovery? Do we go back to a sense of normalcy that we're all hoping for? Do people get out more and then thus generate less at home? Do the small businesses and the restaurants, does their stream pick up and then also reduce the size of what was out at the curbs? And we look forward to having this dialogue with all of you, hearing that those thoughts out and continuing a path forward. But I thank you for acknowledging our work on food. And you're right, we're trying to get out of it as well. And there is a path forward with the right agency to handle that at the mayor's office of food policy. Well, yeah, I mean, and I, because I chair the committee on aging, I want the money back for our seniors to the department for the aging. <laughs> you know, that's <laughs> one thing. But the whole thing with the recycling program, I think like th there needs to be more resources allocated to that. Because I don't think that that's going to change. People are still going to order a lot of stuff online. And those boxes, we need to make sure that they're compressed. I mean, it's like <laughs> recycling program needs to expand. And the organic program, I mean, that's the future. We're talking about climate change. We got to do that. We got to put the, the money uh, into your agency to make sure that you can fulfill this mission. I mean, your, your outreach team, you know, when we did the whole bag giveaway, I mean, your teams were fantastic. I mean, that's why people are using these, you know, sanitation orange reusable bag and, you know, cut back on plastic bag. Uh, but we need more of those education and outreach. So that's why your, your budget, we need to really advocate, Chair, to make sure that we put the resources back uh, to the sanitation department. Thank you. I'll, I'll come back later for more questions. 
Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. No, thank you, Councilmember Chin. Um, so next, we'll hear from Councilmember Brannon, followed by Councilmember Riley. Starting time. Thank you, Council. Thank you, Chair, for this uh, important hearing. Commissioner Grayson, it's good to see you. Um, you know, I always say uh, DSNY workers easily have the most thankless, demanding, important job in our city. Uh, we leave our trash outside and we expect it to disappear. We don't notice when it does disappear, but we start screaming when it doesn't. Um, I really do consider uh, DSNY workers everyday heroes. And um, something that uh, Chair Reynoso and I have been fighting for is to... Uh, get DSNY workers a spot at the front of the line for the vaccine. I think it's insane um, that at this point, uh, you guys are uh, not considered priority uh, for the vaccine. And that's something we're not going to give up until we get that right. Um, getting to the budget, in, in a $90 billion budget, it's not often that you feel cuts immediately. Um, but we certainly felt the cuts last year pretty immediately. It was night and day. Uh, when the mayor cut our corner baskets down to three times a week in my district, I had it at seven times a week. We felt that we saw that we smelled that um, right away immediately. Um, and I had to scramble to use my discretionary funds to restore some of those cuts. And I share uh, Chair Reynoso and what some of my colleagues are saying that sanitation services are not something that I think any of us consider um, superfluous. So we're fighting to make sure that the sanitation budget is where it needs to be, uh, where cuts need to be made. I think they should be made with, um, you know, with, with a surgeon's blade and not with a scythe. Um, so that's something we're going to be looking at this year. I had one question. There's something that uh, came to my attention and concerned me. I understand the administration is planning to outsource and replace uh, DSNY workers currently assigned to uh, Sunday overage at, at all the garages. Now, what, what would happen if we're hit with a storm or some other type of emergency situation that requires uh, rapid response or cleanup? Are these outside contractors going to prepare the fleet for snow removal or sand the streets and that kind of stuff? Thank you for your question and your support. Um, no. So right now we are can, we are working and in, in trying to finalize a proposal. And as you saw it in, as a budget line item, on a potential reduction uh, you know, in all the documents submitted for the prelim budget, that the post that man are, these are manned by sanitation workers that work at each one of our uh, garage locations would be uh, reduced and eliminated in some cases and replaced with the uh, citywide requirements contract uh, security staff. Those, uh, those that, that potential option, those workers would not be able to take our trucks out, respond, and do some of the things that our sanitation workers who currently hold that role do for the city of New York. Okay, so what, how would that work then? If these guys are, if, if, if the administration wants to outsource these guys and replace the workers with who are currently assigned, would then your guys come in if something happened? How would that work? We, we would be, so in that case, like responding to something that sanitation would normally be called to do on a Sunday, we would definitely be delayed in reply, in responding. Uh, we may have to call, uh, a, we may have a limited bandwidth, have to go do an investigation to see what resources would be needed and then call an additional staff. So what, I'm, what concerns me about the proposal on response time from what we have is that our response would be delayed. However, we are still working with OMB on what the final, so, you know, final construct of what the design is. That is looking at it line item, uh, the post that watches the building, who also then does mixed and double use, being replaced with a, with a security guard and not a, from a private firm and doesn't account for any other personnel that we may bring in then on standby. So it is still a, a case in point, but your point is, is more than, than, than heard. Right now, and just so I could address it, right now we would be delayed in responding to anything that happened on a Sunday if that plan were to go forward. And what are they saying? What would this? What would this save the budget? Uh, right now, uh, the cursory analysis that's been done is that it would be four million dollars in the budget, and the reason why it was included is because it is an overtime program, and 
while there are definitely challenges to work out for implementation to make sure that we have some continuity of coverage on Sundays, uh, it doesn't impact direct headcount. So it was a list of, it was part of the list of various DSNY programs that wouldn't further reduce our headcount. Okay. I'm expired. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, obviously I'm not in love with that. I understand we need to tighten our belts a bit. I mean, $4 million in a $90 billion Dutch budget when we start, start, um, you know, standing on the, the edge of outsourcing stuff is really um, something we, we need to take a serious look at. So, but I appreciate it, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman O'Brien. I just want to thank Councilman O'Brien for helping lead the way to recognize the front uh, line st uh, work that is being done by the Department of Sanitation. And the fact that they're not allowed to get the vaccine at this moment, I think is extremely disrespectful and unacceptable. So thank you for taking the, um, the lead on that, Council Member Brennan. I'm happy to, uh, to be partnering with you on that. Um, and I believe it's uh, Council Member Riley, it's your, your turn to ask questions. Thank you, Chair Reynoso. And I, I believe my question was answered. And I appreciated uh, Commissioner Grayson. We had an amazing conversation uh, regarding uh, the quality of life issue that the, that's going on, um, especially after the pandemic. Um, and, and sanitation, I think we need to reimagine um, how we view our sanitation workers, especially um, during this pandemic with the upkeep of trash in our communities and, and the lack of resources that you've you've had um, during this pandemic and, and how hard you guys have been working. So I thank you so much and just wanted to put that out there. My question was answered already, Chair. So thank you so much for giving me a time to talk. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you, Councilman. Now, now we'll hear from Council Member Deutsch. Start in time. Uh, thank you, good afternoon, Commissioner. Um, so basically, I just want to say that I want to thank the men and women of the New York City Department of Sanitation. And as the chair has mentioned, um, he sits on the budget negotiation team as well as I as I do. Um, and this is something we fight for each year to in, increase the basket collections. And this is something we have to continue to do. So we can't always blame it on the May. We have to blame it sometimes on ourselves and convince our colleagues uh, in the committee to make sure that we fund um, the basic essential needs that New Yorkers need, and that is um, the Department of Sanitation. So we have to continue to, to fight the good fight and to, to try to see what we can do. But I only have one question. I want to say that you, you're doing a good job um, um, having oversight on the Department of Sanitation and as well as the food distribution. So I have, my question is, can you take over the vaccine rollout? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> thank you um, for those kind words. Uh, I, I, I cannot, um, and it's not that I, I have, we, we are, I am committed wholeheartedly to being, uh, doing everything I can to serve in this role. Um, however, uh, I think that there is some incredible people who throughout city government who've done an amazing job trying to meet all the needs of the pandemic. But Councilman, I, I appreciate that. That's a nice thing to say, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. We're gonna continue um, showing our support uh, to, to the Department of Sanitation. Thank you. Next will be Council Member Chen. Starting time. Yeah, thank you. I just had a couple of questions about capital. Um, I know that now with all these out, outdoor cafe, it's very hard for the sanitation department, you know, the truck is so big. So are there gonna be some more investment in terms of smaller truck, electric truck um, that would help the environment? Is that part of your capital plan? Great question. Right now, our current capital plan uh, is for the replacement of equipment. We are continuing, now that's a broad statement, but we are continuing to, to look at how to meet the new challenges of the streetscape, i.e., and we've all seen it this year, with the change in the way the streetscape is, trying to get some smaller pieces in. I know that this committee and all of you have championed our ability to try to get some smaller pieces, particularly for snow fighting. And if we look at the new bike lanes and the new smaller spaces, and as yeah. we all try to figure out the landscape of the city and what it will be if outdoor dining and structures and 
the entire way it all changed that we've all been growing through together. So while we do have, we clearly have a capital budget uh, that includes, as I stated in the testimony, money for new equipment, we are continuing to work with and trying to make sure that we right size the best usage of that. For right now, we are looking for replacement vehicles to keep our fleet current. And inside of that, there is definitely going to be discussions on what we could bring in and we may be leveraging some of that capital money to do other pieces, but we're still in, more in negotiations with OMB and the administration to make sure that we right size and to try to grow together and what the new streetscape will be. And I appreciate your question on that. It's, it's totally true and totally needed. The other thing is that I didn't get a um, answer back in my original question. Uh, I guess the, the whole um, organic waste collection um, and composting are, I mean, we've got to be also planning for the future. Uh, so are there you know, things in place that help us, you know, expand this program? I mean, last year was totally, you know, cut because of the budget, but we just can't allow that to continue to happen. I mean, that, that program, you know, the organic waste program needs to expand, especially, you know, how do we get more of the apartment buildings to participate in these programs? Because that is a huge amount of waste that's in the, the regular garbage that could be separated out. Oh, it, and, and I, I apologize for not, I, I kind of, I guess I went long on my last answer with you, but yes, um, uh, I agree. We are committed to moving forward as a future and we definitely need to have an organics waste, a robust organics waste collection program to meet the zero waste goals and to be the sustainable city of the future. Everything that, that we've talked about in this committee, what the chair supports, what all of you have been supportive of, um, there is no curbside organics program funding in the FY22 plan. Uh, we, it's, it, we, we do not have any resources allocated to that. We were able, thanks to the support of many, to restore funding for the community compost, which like you said, that, that, is, a, that is something that we have to, in the limited pool of resources that we had to go to, we definitely wanted to continue to work with our community partners, people that we've had relationships with for decades to try to get that, that ball going and keep it running. And we definitely wanna support what we can with food waste drop offs and community compost partners. That's where our bucket is, but I agree with you wholeheartedly. We, didn't, we do not, this budget currently does not have an organics program built in for curbside you know, pickup and or that high rise building program that was in Manhattan and in parts of the Bronx you know, in the previous year, we do not have that. And we need to build a path forward. Hopefully, if we get federal stimulus money, if the city does rebound, we can get there. For right now, we're playing to what we what we believe our state of affairs will be. And without some kind of available resource pool, we're not going to be able to expand that into 22. We have to play on those. Those are the tough decisions that a lot of agencies had to make. And we're moving into FY22 with the continued suspension of our amazing organics program that had over three and a half million New Yorkers on it and was the largest in the world before we had to suspend it because of the pandemic. And what, what's the amount don't... of budget? What's the amount of budget for that? Uh, almost $19 million. $19 million out of a $92 billion budget. <laughs> 19 million. And I, I understand. Okay, that's good. We, we need to advocate for that because that needs to expand. I mean, we're talking about zero waste and climate change and, and we're cutting this program. And as you mentioned, it was very successful. We were looking forward Not to expanding sure. it and then it was cut. So chair, we gotta work on that. Thank you. Thank you, commissioner. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's unfortunate that um, I feel like this administration has uh, you know, abdicated its responsibility to zero, uh, to zero waste a long time ago, but to invite, um, uh, to climate change and understanding what we need to be doing to, to ensure that we're fighting against um, the, the changes that are happening in our, in our country or in our, in our planet. It's just that, uh, you know, I was concerned about how long it took for us to move forward with the program for organics. And then this happens and then it gets completely gutted. Um, I, I feel like um, COVID gave the administration an excuse to move away from a uh, uh, initiative that it never really supported in the in the on the first in the in in the first place. Uh, now I want to be clear that the position of the Department of Sanitation has never been that. 
but this mayor has made it very clear through his policies and his position that he can care less about zero waste um, and that the organic program is something that he's just not prioritizing. Um, it's extremely unfortunate. Um, and now, you know, Councilman Chen, we're, we're just looking to restore basic services in the city when it comes to sanitation, um, which makes it very difficult for me during the budget negotiating team to ask for more on top of just getting regular services. So I feel like uh, there's a large burden on me and members of this, uh, this committee uh, to just get the city to a, to a place where you know, it's tolerably clean. Uh, and uh, I'm, uh, I'm not looking forward to this, this negotiating session, to say the least. Um, uh, we've also been joined by Council Member Rosenthal. Uh, I wanna acknowledge her. And I think we're gonna get to questions that's a question from the general public. Unless council members have any follow-up, uh, I'll allow them around two. Or um, if uh, there are any other questions that you, the council members may have. It looks good. Okay. Um, I, I do have a, a question related to the outsourcing of the Sunday and holiday security. And for the council members that are on the call, uh, on the Zoom. Uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a way to circumvent, you know, paying our sanitation workers a dignified pay that they've negotiated and have a contract as a union looking to outsource security in a DSNY facility to a private, uh, to, to, to private workers. Um, I, I don't know where the mayor would get the idea that anyone in the council would be supportive of uh, taking jobs away from sanitation workers to give it to a private firm to do security, um, Sunday and holiday security at our sanitation uh, garages. Um, can you please explain that a bit more? Because uh, we did a lot of work to take the, the tertiary street contracts away from folks um, when it should have been done by our sanitation workers. And now seeing this, it's just a, it's a, a close reminder of, of that type of work that has happened in the past. Can you explain this uh, outsourcing of security? Yes, Chair. Um, right now, the proposed outsourcing of the Sunday security is, uh, it's, it was part of a listing of all of our overtime programs um, that were, we had to itemize while we're doing, this is a, a tough budget, as you well know. Um, you know more than me, as how tough it is citywide with other agencies as well. And this is a program that uh, while would reduce the amount of sanitation workers that work each Sunday to secure our facilities, replace them one for one with a private guard and uh, have a $4 million value at the end of that. And it's a straight line, it's a budget decision uh, that, we're, that, we're, that we're still negotiating and talking about, but it's in, it made our list of how we would help do our part to tighten our belts. I just wanna, I want a, a, an equivalent here why not get rid of every single sanitation worker in the city of New York and replace them with a private firm to do work, uh, to do trash collection, right? Uh, it's the same thing. What we're saying here is that uh, to save $4 million, right, uh, which is nickel and diming at this point, the Department of Sanitation, uh, we're going to take away roles and responsibilities that the sanitation workers have done for a long time. And I'm just, I'm just uh, you know, it, it starts here in security and then it'll be somewhere else. Tomorrow it'll be you know, who's cleaning the trucks, maybe we could privatize that work. And um, it's just a, it's a, a slippery slope when we start taking work away from the sanitation workers and giving it to private uh, firms. So I'm extremely concerned about that. It's something I'm not going to accept. I want to be very clear. Um, we, I, I'm going to, th this budget is going to be something that's going to be very difficult for me to vote for. Um, I had concerns in the last budget over uh, the amount of money that was going to policing, but in this budget, the cuts that are happening to the Department of Sanitation are just unacceptable. And I, I don't see myself being, uh, being able to move forward with a, a budget that does this to the Department of Sanitation. Um, I see um, Council Member Rosenthal wants to ask some questions. So before I continue with my questions, I wanna give her the opportunity to speak. So Council Member Rosenthal. Thanks so much, Chair. Um, I really appreciate just a, a, a probably one quick question. Um, Commissioner, congratulations, welcome. You got lucky, you got one of the best council members, uh, except for council members, Chin, Riley, uh, <laughs> Brandon, anyway. Um, so 
I just want to follow up on, on, on what Chair Reynoso was talking about. So currently sanitation workers do the security. How does it work currently? Well, currently uh, for, so Sunday, we, in addition to some other ancillary cleaning functions that are, uh, you know, some, some, there are some litter basket collection trucks that get dispatched, but our facilities, our sanitation garages and our dispatch locations uh, up until now, up at, currently right now in the current program, we have a sanitation worker who mans that facility uh, or, you know, covers the shift and he or she would do perimeter sweeps, make sure that the trucks are secure. They have a listing of duties and responsibilities and they would be the first, if we had to dispatch someone on a Sunday evening, so to speak, to go address an oil spill because of a motor vehicle accident or, or something like they would be our first responder, so to speak out there in conjunction yeah. with some of the supervisory staff. That's what that's what we're talking about. Okay, and um, just very bluntly, are those union positions or management positions? Uh, they are all covered by a collective bargaining. They're all union jobs. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Chair Reynoso. Thank you, uh, uh, Councilman Rosenthal. And, and I just want to follow up. Uh, would, these, would this security firm be able to uh, show up emergency wise to let's say an oil spill uh commissioner grayson and do that work that this that this um uh, current sanitation worker does would they be able to take on no, that responsibility sure. no okay no sure. so, okay so i just want to i just want to make sure that we 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 recognize that and then the last thing i'm going to ask before we get to our, our panelists um, i want to allow for the folks in the general public to speak our lot cleaning is down 57 percent we had 1,018 lots cleaned last year, and this year, 443. Half, half. Uh, and a big part of this is just the sites, right? It's just everyone seeing all the garbage everywhere, including in these lots. Um, you know, what, what, is the, what is the current response time, I guess? How long does it take if I report a, a lot that needs to be cleaned? How long is it taking this year as opposed to what it took last year. I just wanna know the difference between uh, length of time uh, as to like what, what somebody did in 2020 and what somebody's doing in 2021. Uh, so we are definitely seeing a lag. Uh, Chair, you're, you're, you're spot on with, you know, and we've seen it. So it's, yeah. you know, the, the compounded with the fact that we reduced the unit in the last go around, um, you throw in the pandemic with, which also you know, curtailed off some of the administrative functions with particularly with cleaning the private lots where we need a writ and you know, there's an entire administrative process to go onto private property to clean something up. So compounded between the cuts and the delays, we're probably up, I believe it is about 20% of a increase in, in, in lead time. We used to be able to soup to nuts, get those lots cleaned from start to finish in somewhere around you know, 60 or so days, and now we're closer to 80. 80. So I, I'll end it with this. Um, Commissioner Grayson, what they're doing to you is unbelievable. The fact that they would want us to operate uh, a, a, the sanitation department under these, you know, vicious cuts um, and continuing to have them and then have you sit up here and have to, you know, speak on how you're going to do more with less um, is just, uh, it's unfair. It's, uh, and it's not something that I think this council is going to stand for, um, especially just because you guys have done, done it gracefully and professionally, uh, including the snow removal and just the trash removal. It's just uh, when you talk about departments that have done things right, this is one that we could always point to to be proud of. Um, and what they're doing now is, you know, jeopardizing that record or, or that reputation um, to nickel and dime, dime ourselves. So. I'm, I'm so sorry that this is happening and we will not, we will not, I will not stand for it. I'm looking forward to our next fight with the mayor on this issue. And um, I think council member Rosenthal has a couple of questions left and then we'll go into our panelists. Thank you again, Commissioner Grayson. Thank you. Sorry, it, you just, uh, this usually happens with us, <laughs> council member right now. So we each yeah, learn from each other. Yeah, yeah. So commissioner, um, the people who do the Sunday security, have they ever had an incident? Like, do you have 
you know, like over the last year, there have been five incidents that they have had to respond to and it's blah, blah, blah. Or um, yeah, has that, has there, or have there been any break-ins that they've had to deal with? Um, so that's a great question. Yes, we, we definitely have uh, at least in, in we, we respond to over a hundred or so incidents uh, you know, the, the men and women of the department who are working the Sunday security currently um, will go out, you know, for icy conditions uh, to pick up a condition to respond to an emergency to help uh, assist PD with blocking an orphan area to respond. Right. A lot of times in wintertime, if there is a fire um, and God, I, oh my, you know, when the fire department has to now hose down a block, we now have to come and respond on a Sunday and add salt, even though it's not snowing. So yes, clearly over a hundred instances routinely uh, per year, we will have to respond to something like that. And then as far as uh, people who walk onto the property or you know, uh, unwelcome visitors or you know, however it is, I, I don't know that they're always break-ins, but you know, sometimes you get uh, uh, someone who wanders onto the property. Uh, we have had to engage them you know, multiple times you know, to try to make sure that they're safe, especially in the parking lots or the areas that we have that are not fully secured because we want to keep them safe because a lot of our trucks and equipment can be dangerous if you don't know what you're doing even when they're not started there's still things you don't want you know we don't we can't have people touching it if they're not skilled and not trained so councilmember reynoso i think it would be interesting for the committee to get those kinds of stats um i agree every so every time step, but you know to find out about those hundred or so even if it's a draft you know that's why they use the word draft. It doesn't have to be exact, but you know, that sounds like two a week, which is not unsubstantial. Um, yeah, just, yeah. Okay, thank you very I'll, much. Yeah, we'll follow up and Commissioner Grayson, you can do that and just uh, the type of incidents that they've had to respond to. Um, that, and I wanna be clear, it sounds to me and obviously Council Member Rosenthal that these are situational, a situation where we might not be able to respond anymore, where we might not be able to attend, should we move this to private firms? Um, and if we are going to attend to them, it would mean that we're still using sanitation workers and are just spending twice as much money. I just don't understand managerially, outside of someone that is not work, someone that is not from the Department of Sanitation looking at this budget line and thinking that they can cut it, um, or, you know, you're being forced to do this. So. Um, Again, I think there's a lot of a lot of nonsense happening here that we need to we need to get to the bottom of, and um, and we will. Uh, again, I want to be very clear, Commissioner Grayson, that I, this is not a reflection on you or the department. Um, uh, our frustration lies almost exclusively with the uh, administration. Um, okay, so now, uh, thank you. So now we're gonna go to our panelists, um, Council. Uh, what is it? Abina, yeah. are you are you you gonna take I'm it away? Here. Go ahead, go ahead. Um, so we'll now turn to testimony from members of the public who have signed up to testify. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our in-person council hearings, we will be calling on individuals one by one to testify. Once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the sergeant at arms will set the timer and announce that you may begin. Your testimony will be limited to three minutes. We'll begin testimony with Tok Oyewoye, followed by Justin Wood, followed by Eric Goldstein. You can begin after the sergeant begins the timer. Starting time. Okay. Um, good afternoon. My name is Dr. Topoyula and I'm testifying on behalf of the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance. Founded in 1991, NIJA is a nonprofit citywide membership network linking grassroots organizations from low income neighborhoods and communities of color in their fight for environmental and climate justice. For decades, NIJA has led efforts for comprehensive policy reforms to address the disproportionate burden of New York's solid waste system on a handful of environmental justice communities. The impacts of the solid waste system on, um, oh, sorry. Yeah, the, the impacts of the solid waste system are greatest in the few low-income communities and communities of color where truck-dependent transfer stations are clustered, causing higher proportions of health consequences such as asthma, heart disease, and various cancers. We're here today to advocate for adjustments in the city budget 
allocation for the upcoming fiscal years pertaining to solid waste and composting that we think would dramatically improve equity for environmental justice and frontline communities and ensure the city's commitment uh, to its stated goals. Some of these changes also pertain to the Committee on Land Use. As our colleagues in the Save Our Compost Coalition uh, will share at this hearing, we're proposing a moderate budget proposal of $14.75 million for the upcoming uh, fiscal year for a few um, purposes pertaining to organics. Uh, that will gird us for full implementation of a mandatory organics collection and processing budget in uh, the subsequent fiscal year. The current request is inclusive of community composting and food scrap drop-off programs at 7 million, including compensation for this work, uh, zero waste schools at a million, multifamily building collection and processing pilot to implementation program, uh, inclusive of NYCHA at 2 million, an analysis of organics programs toward implementing citywide curbside uh, compost collection at uh, 250,000. Um, and you know that analysis ideally to be concluded by the end of 2021 and uh, municipal agency composting at a million. Um, and budget allowing, which I'll talk about shortly, uh, reinstating and expanding curbside organics collection. Um, today I'll, I'll highlight um, the creation of new composting sites and uh, others in our coalition will talk about other issues. So in order to compost the growing volume um, of food scraps generated uh, by the drop-off program and build capacity for localizing organic waste uh, processing and green jobs, the city should fund the construction of community composting sites throughout the city on parks and or other city land to provide equitably siting, uh, sited composting resources throughout the city. Even with limited drop-off sites compared to pre-COVID times, the current processing sites are facing capacity issues. Uh, currently, there are uh, a number of composting sites I won't list now, but um, the city should partner with nonprofits to build community composting sites throughout the city with at least six new sites, two in the Bronx. One Time in the expired. Um, I'll, I'll finish quickly by saying, um, you know, we should, uh, composting locally um, will enable us to save funds on exporting recyclable materials out of the city in the long term. Uh, we, we need to um, preserve Lower East Side Ecology Center and big reuse. And uh, I must say that even though we're not making a huge push for mandatory organics in light of the budget constraints, this will change if we're allocated federal funding. Um, we have until 2030 to curb greenhouse gas emissions to prevent global warming above 1.5 degrees Celsius. So we must advance bold and hard hitting solutions at every chance that we get. Um, and separate from organics, we're asking for 4 million for staffing of the commercial waste zones um, uh, law. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Oyewale. I, I would say that um, commissioner, or uh, former commissioner Garcia, who is now running for mayor, is actually using or stating that the uh, mandatory organics work would actually be a benefit to the city as a cost-saving measure and a job-producing measure and something she would implement should be, she become mayor. Um, so um, it's interesting what you know, some, some leaders think versus others as to what is a, 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 like a valuable asset for the city of New York. So very interesting, but thank you, Dr. Owale. Thank you. Next, we'll uh, invite Justin Wood to testify, followed by Eric Goldstein, followed by C.D. Flaherty. Starting time. Hi, uh, thank you, Chair Reynoso and members of the committee and to the commissioner and uh, deputy commissioners of sanitation. My name is Justin Wood. I'm the director of policy at New York Lawyers for the Public Interest. Um, thanks for the opportunity to testify today and for your consistent leadership on the critical issues of racial equity, worker safety, sustainability, and green jobs in the city's solid waste system. We really no longer need to be here debating the clear and present danger posed by greenhouse gas emissions, including those from solid waste, which is fully within the city's control, unlike some other um, energy systems and things that contribute to uh, emissions. The recent extreme weather crisis in Texas and the Midwest is just the latest graphic reminder. And we're really worried that uh, amidst this, this COVID budget 
uh, situation that we're abandoning our efforts to transform both the commercial and residential waste systems to sharply reduce climate emissions, local air pollution, and the safety hazards caused by an outdated system that exports far too much waste to landfills and incinerators in environmental justice communities. So while recognizing the challenges that we face in this budget, we urge you to embrace and negotiate for two bare minimum uh, proposals to address this. First is continuing with the full and robust implementation of the commercial waste zone law passed by the council in 2019, including a transition to zero emissions, private sanitation truck fleets and major investment in recycling infrastructure. Uh, the historic transition to a far more efficient and accountable zone system will benefit workers, EJ communities who have been among, among the hardest hit by the pandemic and the unemployment crisis and will improve service and transparency for businesses, reduce emissions, and stimulate local investment by increasing recycling and make the streets safer and cleaner for all New Yorkers. And so uh, similar to New York City Environmental Justice Alliance and our uh, other partners in Transform Don't Trash New York, we really uh, urge the um, administration and council to commit to a $4 million um, budget to negotiate and implement the contracts underpinning the new uh, commercial waste zone system, hire the necessary staff with the expectation that that system can become self-sustaining in the future. And then second, we wanna echo um, the urgent call uh, to include a modest $14 million budget for organics, residential organics recycling um, this year. This proposal would support vital in-city composters, double the reach of the popular food scrap drop-off program. Um, and thank you to the council for uh, restoring um, that program at a, at a small but meaningful level this year. Restart compost education in public schools and begin piloting innovative technologies and outreach programs to ensure that the majority of New Yorkers living in multifamily buildings will soon have an accessible, easy uh, way to recycle their food scraps. Um, this would lay the groundwork for what we really need, which is a citywide mandatory organics program. And we urge you to include this funding and create these jobs in this year's budget and look forward to working with you on the details. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next will be Eric Goldstein, followed by Phoebe Flaherty, followed by Emily Bachman. Starting time. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Chairman Reynoso. Thank you, Council Member Chin and members of the committee. I'm Eric Goldstein from the Natural Resources Defense Council. The failure to deal sustainably with the city's organics, that's food waste and yard waste, has been one of the biggest disappointments on the environmental front during the full eight years of the de Blasio administration. When the mayor took office, the administration pledged that New York City would become a national leader on organics handling. In fact, exactly the opposite has happened. And this is not the fault of Commissioner Grayson or Commissioner Garcia, but the nation's largest pilot project for curbside food waste collection was itself scrapped last spring. The community composting operation that has been so successful in handling food waste sustainably, teaching kids about nature, and uh, returning finished compost to neighborhoods that residents use in their street trees, in their plants, and in community gardens was also zeroed out during last year's pandemic budget. And only an outcry by diverse constituencies across the city and last minute intervention by this council for which we're most appreciative uh, was able to resuscitate at least a portion of those operations. Although the number of sites now operating is less than two thirds of what had been there originally. And even the composting program at the city's public schools, so essential to teaching the next generation about climate and to reduce, uh, uh, to uh, identify s sensible ways to reduce food waste. Even this program has had its funding slashed. In this year's proposed budget, the bad news for most of these environmental programs continued. Why is it so difficult for government officials, budget officials, to think and plan for the long term, even when the long term dangers and opportunities are so apparent? NRDC is part of the Save Our Compost Coalition. We join our colleagues in urging restoration of $14.7 million for all of these programs. Three in particular I'd like to mention. One is Grow NYC Zero Waste Programs, which have been the mainstay of New York City composting since the very beginnings of collection at the popular green market sites. 
These have been some of the highest performing sites in terms of tonnage in the, in the entire city, but this whole program is zeroed out in the mayor's preliminary budget. Private funding is unlikely to be available and Grow NYC deserves and New Yorkers need the council to fund the Grow NYC operations and at the fiscal FY20 level, which was approximately $2.5 million. Second additional priority funding need is to open new community composting sites in underserved communities that still do not have convenient drop-off locations. Same is true for NYCHA developments. This is simply a matter of fairness and equity. All New Yorkers have a right to convenient access to food waste composting, and the council needs to right this wrong by providing additional funding to establish and expand these sites. Finally, there's the need for restoration of composting and recycling at all New York City public schools, beginning in September, when we hope and expect the schools will be back to more or less normal operations. It's so important to teach young children about nature and the climate crisis and to get them in the habit of separating their food waste from ordinary trash. We're counting on the city council, which has historically been a leader on city environmental issues, to step in and reprioritize these essential sanitation programs for which all, from which all New Yorkers will benefit. And oh yes, in my written testimony, I outlined the critical need for $4 million in funding to continue the commercial waste zone implementation, which you, Chairman Reynoso, are very, very familiar with. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Eric. Next will be Phoebe Flaherty, followed by Emily Bachman, followed by Christine Dates Romero. Starting time. Hi, good afternoon, and thanks for the opportunity to testify. I'm Phoebe Flaherty, an organizer at Align. Um, we coordinate the Climate Works for All Coalition and Transformed on Trash Coalitions that led to passing Local Law 97 and Local Law 199 commercial waste zones. Um, and you know, we all know we're still in the middle of the pandemic and uh, New York's black and brown environmental justice communities are bearing the brunt of the impact of the virus and that kind of downturn. Um, so we're here to join the chorus and call on the city budget to prioritize investment and job creation for communities that have been hit the hardest by this pandemic. Uh, the Climate Works for All Coalition created an equitable recovery report, which is a roadmap to creating 100,000 good green jobs for New York City's black and brown communities and move us out of the pandemic. Um, and this by investing $16 billion over three years to create 100,000 jobs. And, you know, we believe this is the comprehensive plan we need to move our city through the crisis and towards equity and climate justice. Um, and we know that, you know, we have to take steps to move us there. And so we've developed some interim budget priorities, many of which uh, the folks on who've already testified today have mentioned. Um, so within the city's 2023 budget, we're calling for an investment of 17 million for public waste management, including 4 million for the implementation of commercial waste zones um, and 13 million to expand organics collection. And so I know folks have spoken to um, previously to what those numbers would go towards, um, you know, for expanding organics, it, it's going to go towards laying the groundwork for uh, the cost effective citywide mandatory organic waste recycling system. Um, by doubling the capacity of community foods drop-off program um, and piloting new technology, um, et cetera. And, you know, DSNY will also need $7 million to expand community drop-off composting, plus $6 million to initiate food scrap collection from larger residential uh, government buildings this year. Um, and we're also advocating for an investment of $4 million to uh, staff up for the implementation of commercial waste zones, as others have mentioned as well. Um, additionally, within the Climate Works for All Equitable Recovery Report, we're asking for additional funding for retrofitting school buildings and installing solar on schools and expanding um, clean transportation and viewing this as a collective um, ask coming from the coalition. Um, and we believe these investments are what are necessary to, you know, invest in New York's BIPOC frontline environmental justice communities and in address the inequities of the pandemic and move us out of the COVID crisis uh, while addressing the climate crisis. Um, so thank you for your time and consideration today. Thank you. Next we'll hear from Emily Bachman, followed by Christine Dates Romero, followed by Justin Green. Starting time. Thank you. Um, thanks for this opportunity to testify in support of increasing funding for composting in, fiscal, in the fiscal year 22 budget. 
My name is Emily Bachman, and I'm the compost program manager at GrowNYC, where we've been running food scrap drop-off sites like the one behind me since 2011. We pop up at green markets, subway stations, and community gardens to collect household food scraps from New York City residents, and we partner with New York City Compost Project host sites to make compost locally. First, I just want to be clear that the preliminary budget leaves overall funding for composting at just 13% of fiscal year 20 levels, and it does not fully restore funding for community composting. As Eric stated earlier, the 3.5 million proposed for community composting does not include Grow NYC, which operates the largest food scrap drop-off sites in New York City. Our funding has historically been included in the recycling outreach line of the budget and our fiscal year 20 funding for composting was about 2.5 million. Our DSMI funding is 80% lower this year and is completely missing from the proposed budget. So, with this year's smaller budget, we have been very happy to reopen 15 of our 76 former food scrap drop-off sites to hire 20 compost coordinators and drivers, engage 118 volunteers, and collect over 17 tons of food scraps for composting every single week. The response from the public has been awe-inspiring, truly. On average, collections at our reopened sites are 30% higher today than they were before COVID. Collections are 20% higher in the South Bronx, 55% higher in the Upper West Side, 60% higher in Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn, 145% higher in Carroll Gardens. This growth is both encouraging and alarming. We are thrilled to see New Yorkers' commitment to composting, but severely limited in our ability to meet existing demand due to budget cuts. Meanwhile, our private sector fundraising efforts are consistently met with rejection due to potential donors' beliefs that residential waste management in New York should be publicly funded at the municipal level. We support the Save Our Compost Coalition's request for $14.75 million, which includes $2.5 million for, for the Grow NYC Compost Program. And while still much less than pre-COVID funding, we believe that funding at these levels would dramatically increase access to composting for all New Yorkers this year, while setting us back on track toward establishing universal curbside composting program in the near term. And uh, just to finish up, I. I want to say we're incredibly thankful to the City Council and the Department of Sanitation for your support over the years. And we just sincerely hope to see renewed commitment to our city zero waste goals reflected in the Department of Sanitation budget for fiscal year 22 so we can continue collaborating on this work. Thanks. Thank you. Next will be Christine Dates Romero, followed by Justin Green, followed by Susie Panita. Starting time. center has offered um, community-based composting for the last 30 years and the lockdown uh, due to the COVID uh, um, uh, crisis is the first time in our history when we had to pause our collection operations. Fortunately, we were able to open up drop-off locations again last July thanks to the budget restorations spearheaded by the city council. We are very grateful for this restoration. Since then, we have seen a steady increase in participation and in organics diverted from the landfill. One record month, breaking month is following the next record breaking month, just like Emily was uh, saying in January alone, we collected and processed over 130,000 pounds of organics serving thousands of households uh, through 10 drop-off locations in Lower Manhattan. Keeping community-based composting programs well-funded will allow us to bridge the gap until the city is in a position to implement citywide organics collection from each city household. As part of the Save Our Compost Coalition, we call for the investment into composting programs in the amount of 14.75 million, including 7 million to support not only the existing network of our community-based composting network, but to expand that network to at least have uh, uh, six additional composting processing sites in the boroughs, uh, because we need to ensure local processing of food scraps and create green jobs. 
we also, I would also be remiss to not call out the urgent need to continue our policy work. And again, I want to thank uh, Chairman Reynoso, who held a, a city council oversight hearing together with the Parks Department to really move the needle to make sure that both uh, the Lower East Side Ecology Center and Big Reuse will continue to have a space in city parks uh, to continue our, our sustainability work there. Um, I briefly want to also talk about the other recycling program that has disappeared due to budget constraints last year, and that's e-waste collection. Um, disposing of unwanted electronics is illegal in New York City, in New York State, and um, the service reductions that uh, the um, Senate that were installed last year really uh, left New York City residents with very few options for disposal of their old gadgets. We heard a lot about dirty streets. Well, if you walk around, I'm sure you have also witnessed um, e-waste uh, being dumped on street corners illegally, which is really um, not where we should be heading. Um, I listened to Commissioner Grayson the other day uh, at the Brooklyn Swab, where he announced that at least safe events and uh, the special household waste collection sites are coming back in the new fiscal year, which I think is a step in the right direction. And again, uh, I want to thank the city council for their support of our program. Uh, we've been running an e-waste program uh, since 2003, and uh, we cannot uh, afford to walk away from sustainability programs that address our climate crisis. And I'd like to uh, thank the city council for all their support. Thank you. Thank you. Next will be Justin Green, followed by CC Pinita, followed by Carlos Castel Crook. Starting time. Hey, uh, good afternoon, uh, City Council. Uh, thanks so much for having us. Um, I'm here to recommend uh, that the City Council budget include 14.75 million, uh, as recommended by many other uh, environmental organizations on this call, to expand composting throughout the city. Um, we're really thankful to City Council and Department of Sanitation for their support of our work in the past um, and DSNY's commitment to environmental, uh, innovative environmental programming um, really makes, uh, I think, uh, this Department of Sanitation stand out nationwide in terms of its approach prior to COVID. Um, we're also really thankful to City Council for uh, your efforts to support Big Reuse and Lower East Side Ecology Center's effort to continue our, our long standing community composting sites uh, located on parks land. Um, we appreciate that effort and hope we can uh, are successful. Um, Big Reuse, the organization I am, ex am executive director of is part of the uh, city's composting program. We operate two community composting sites that compost um, a thousand tons of residential food waste and parks waste every year. We give that uh, compost out to the community, to 200 community groups for greening activities and parks. Um, we work with the uh, current food scrap drop-off effort where we're hauling from 30 food scrap drop-offs throughout the city and uh, soon to expand um, with our other partners to reach every community board um, in the city. Um, and that's you know, due to our close work with the Department of Sanitation and City Council funding. Um, we're requesting the additional funds to, as everyone has stated, um, to expand that effort. I mean, the effort has been so successful, we are overwhelmed with the amount of, of participation and need to add both uh, hauling capacity, um, composting capacity, and uh, distribution uh, programs that we had had before. Um, so that's funding not only our efforts, but those at the Botanical Gardens and Grown YC and uh, Earth Matter on the East Side. Um, we also would like to see the addition of community composting sites throughout the city. Um, there are, Bronx currently does not have um, similar sites that, that we have in Queens and Brooklyn, um, Eastern Queens, also Southern Brooklyn. There are a number of areas that could use community composting sites to compost locally and provide compost to those street tree care and the uh, community gardens that are desperately in need of soil amendments. Um, and, I guess most of all, I think we would like to see, or I big reuse would like to see is a return to a curbside composting collection. Um, the amounts uh, named in the budget is in terms of savings of 19, 20, 25 million are so minuscule in the overall scheme of things that it seems clear we should return to I'm curbside. 
composting collection as soon as possible. And I think with um, making it mandatory and save as you throw, we will see we would see um, optimized collection routes and scaled uh, composting sites that would reduce the cost and make it uh, efficient and affordable. So I, we ask uh, strongly that we look at that and return to curbside composting collection as soon as possible. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next will be Susie Panita, followed by Carlos Castell Crook, followed by Anna Sack. Starting in time. Good afternoon. My name is Ceci Panetta, and I'm the executive director at BK Rot. We're a youth powered composting project that collects food scraps by bike and composts them at our partner gardens. I'm testifying today to urge the Department of Sanitation to increase the New York City Compost Project's fiscal year 22 budget allocation to 14.75 million. Um, we were founded in 2013 in part due to a lack of public composting options in our neighborhoods and eight years later, we find our mission increasingly relevant. Last year, we collected the largest amount of residential organic waste since launching, more than doubling our previous record in 2019. Residential organic waste collection and processing is a public good. It creates a surplus of social, economic, and ecological benefits. And it's our opinion that this service should be fully managed and overseen by the city. However, as council member Reynoso also stated, currently our organics collection and processing functions off the service and labor that isn't compensated by the city. Um, even at the start of this fiscal year, before city funded food scraps drop offs reopened, we implemented our contactless food scraps drop off. This significantly increased the labor demand on our youth drop off managers whose incomes are sustained by donations from our neighbors who use our drop off service. New Yorkers understand the great importance and need to responsibly manage the resources we use. Composting is one of the most accessible tools to do so, and that's in part why we see hundreds of volunteers show up to support responsible waste management. And anyone today whose eyes are opening open to the suffering of the climate crisis carry a profound desire to rise and take the magnitude of actions demanded to address it. I wish the city budget and sanitation's budget would also recognize and reflect this responsibility. This upcoming fiscal year has an immense opportunity to advance efficient, just, and accessible systems to collect and process residential organic waste, all the while creating great opportunities for local employment. And in our experience, um, benefits from organic from, from these systems significantly amplify um, when initiatives are hyper-localized, use zero to low emissions technologies, and include an environmental justice analysis. Um, we urge the Committee of Sanitation and Solid Waste to deeply consider the ecological, climate, and social justice crises in structuring their budget for this upcoming fiscal year and increase the um, budget for the New York City Compost Project to $14.75 million. And as others on this call have also shared for community composting and uh, the food scraps drop-off program for new compost processing facilities, for multi-family building collection and processing pilot, um, to also pilot zero, uh, zero waste schools programs uh, for composting in um, municipal agencies and facilities, and also for a feasibility study on citywide curbside composting. Um, we urge any pilots to center and prioritize low-income New Yorkers and environmental justice communities that have historically been deprioritized in city organics recycling programs. Um, thank you for your time. And as fellow sanitation workers, we deeply appreciate and respect your service. Thank you. Next will be Carlos castell Croak, followed by Anna Sachs, followed by Marissa DiDominicus. Starting time. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Carlos castell Croak, and I'm the associate for New York City programs at the New York League of Conservation Voters. NYLCV represents over 30,000 members in New York City, and we are committed to advancing a sustainability agenda that will make our people, our neighborhoods, and our economy healthier and more resilient. I'd like to thank Chair Reynoso and all the city council members um, on the committee for the opportunity to testify today. NYLCV supports a fiscal year 22 budget um, that secures progress as me uh, on many of the environmental, transportation, and public health priorities Mayor de Blasio has committed to in one NYC and beyond. Our city is on the precipice of the road to recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic, and it is incumbent upon our elected leaders to invest our tax dollars in climate action solutions as we rebound from this crisis and not lose ground. 
Last year, the city made substantial cuts to programs that were originally implemented to make progress on our sanitation related climate goals. The city was already behind schedule on meeting its zero waste goal of reducing the amount of waste we send to landfills by 90% by 2030 before these cuts. So we implore the city that we implore that the city take bold action to drastically reduce waste over the next nine years. First, we must ensure that the Department of Sanitation has the funding they need to properly implement commercial waste zones. This program, which was established as Local Law 199 of 2019, will reduce emissions and improve safety for workers and pedestrians by requiring commercial carters to operate within waste zones instead of rushing to cover long and gratuitous routes. We ask that the Department of Sanitation receive $4 million to fully fund the staff, consultants, and data management needed to implement this program. The fiscal year 22 budget must also include the $14 million in funding for composting programs across the city that will start to bring us back towards our zero waste goals. This money will include doubling the current funding for New York's food scrap, uh, food scrap drop off program, providing additional funding to large scale compost sites such as Big Reuse and Lower East Side Ecology Center, reinstating the in school composting educational program, and exploring a multifamily building collection pilot program. This 14 million in funding will set the city up to take aggressive waste reduction actions in the near future. Initially, the City Council should also pass intros 1942 and 1943, sponsored by Councilmember Powers and Reynoso, respectively. Uh, these bills would establish community compost recycling drop up sites to equitably serve New York City's residents by establishing and enforcing good recycling habits and reducing waste. Then, very soon after this, the city needs to introduce legislation to create a citywide curbside composting program and ensure that this program is fully funded. This initiative will ultimately save the city money, put organic materials back to use as fossil and soil amendments instead of treated as waste, reduce emissions from landfills, and put us back on track with these zero waste goals. Achieving zero waste and carbon neutrality will require financial commitments from the city in this and future budgets, and we look forward to working with the council to achieve this goal. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Anna Sachs, followed by Marissa DiDomenicus, followed by Wiley Goodman. Starting time. Hi, my name is Anna Sachs, and I'm testifying as a member of the Save Our Compost Coalition. According to the DSNY Waste Characterization Study from 2017, 34% of New York City's re residential waste consists of material that's suitable for composting. You would think that, as a result, composting would receive comparable funding from the city. But last year, we as a city spent $2.86 million on composting, which we only won because of a hard fight. And thank you, Reynoso, for your support and other members of the council. But we spent four, over $400 million exporting our trash to landfills and incinerators located mostly in environmental justice communities. We no longer have curbside composting. We no longer have composting at schools, no longer have all of the food scrap drop-off sites because of a limited budget and big reuse and the Lower East Side Ecology Center, which is two of our largest uh, community composting sites are set to be evicted by June by the de Blasio administration's park leadership. New York City's residential waste system, including composting needs to be fixed. And now is the time to set the groundwork for a better system. We are asking for a modest 14.75 million for New York City's composting system, realizing the city is facing a fiscal crisis. We need to continue composting and expand it. And we also need to understand how post COVID we can make composting more successful and more cost effective. For this, we need funding for studies and pilots, which must be publicly funded. Community composting creates local green job, reduces waste, sends to landfills and incinerators. And in the finished compost replenishes New York City soil. And it's also a way of um, building a more, more resilient climate that can absorb more rainwater. Please do not treat sustainable waste management as a luxury. Thank you. Thank you. Next we'll hear from Marissa Dudominicus, followed by Wiley Goodman, followed by Kate Peterson. Starting talk. Good afternoon, council members. I'm speaking today in support of the Save Our Compost budget request. And as a member of the Save Our Compost in the ED of Earth Matter New York, a nonprofit organization located on Governor's Island. We're contracted by the Department of Sanitation's New York City Compost Project. And we're in a position to assert the success of community compost efforts as part of the city's waste management solutions since 2012. Our New York State Department of Environmental Conservation Compost facility processes 800 tons of organic material annually. 
We're one of several facilities with a proven track record of reducing waste exportation and creating an invaluable soil amendment in New York City for New York City. The two, two, 2017 uh, Community Compost Report shows the pie chart that says that we can compost 31% from the waste stream, but that 99% is going into the waste stream. I'm here today to respectfully request that this committee ensures that there's a decrease in the amount of organic waste going to incineration and landfills in 2022. I urge you to allocate additional composting funding as the budget priority in the following three areas. One, invest in infrastructure. Ensure big and lower east side have permanent homes in parks. Add Advocate addition, allocate additional land and resources to create six additional compost facilities located strategically in all the boroughs to increase the local compost processing capacity and educational hubs. These facilities will create the green jobs for many of the skilled volunteers who dedicate and donate thousands of hours to compost neighbor organics in their small community and parks right now. The suspension of the curbside program allows for the exploration of innovative 24-7 staff systems where residents can walk to collectively shared bins. The EMZ bin or in other systems may be a good way to service our densely populated ur urban settings such as NYCHA or Chinatown. And finally, compost education for everyone in schools, for residents, offices, the Parks Department, please increase funding to Grow New York City and other composting organizations trained to provide the education necessary to ensure the success of New York City composting. Thank you so much for this opportunity to share my views and your support of the reinstation, reinstating of the partial budget from last year. Thank you. Next will be Wiley Goodman, followed by Kate Peterson, followed by Katie Savage. Starting time. Hello, thank you, Sanitation and Solid Waste Committee members, particularly Chair Reynoso and Queens members, Constantinides and Gennaro, and Queens based DSNY Commissioner Grayson. I'm in attendance. My name is Wiley Goodman. I am the chair of the Queen's Solid Waste Advisory Board Organizing Committee. However, to be clear, I am testifying today as an individual Queen's resident, not in my formal role. In the same way that city bikes change transportation behavior by bringing biking to the neighborhood level, we need to change New Yorkers' waste behavior by bringing waste collection to the neighborhood level through community-led organic waste collection and processing. With cuts to DSNY's budget to funds that formerly went to organic voluntary curbside collection, New York City Compost Project Partners and Grow NYC food scrap drop-off sites, much of this work is being done now by women-led and BIPOC-led nonprofits and small businesses, but these are not dispersed equally across the city and in Queens, we lack these services entirely. For this reason, I strongly urge an amended FY22 DSNY budget that restores the 14.75 million already noted to increase the capacity of local neighborhood-based composting collection and processing, as well as e-waste waste recycling in partnership with organizations such as Big Reuse, Queens Botanic Garden, Grow NYC, among others. This is not because our highly value, valuable and respected unionized work Force cannot do the work, but because when waste is exclusively handled through what might feel to many as an anonymous city agency, it allows the public's out of sight, out of mind uh, mindset around waste to continue. To change behavior, New Yorkers need to see people who look like them going the extra mile to separate the 22 to 40 percent of our waste that includes organics and rewarded for doing so by being given locally produced compost they can use to amend street tree beds rain gardens, community gardens, and even feed their house plants. Similarly, similarly, we need to change the behavior of the next generation of New Yorkers by restoring funding for zero waste schools focused on organics and repair clinics, which teach youth the skills they need to repair and reuse, the latter of which we have never had to my knowledge. Without such programs, youth will continue to feel disconnected from the materials they use, rather than see themselves as active contributors to a circular economy 
and potential future workers in a well-paid green workforce, which they easily could be if they were taught early and often. We know the economic fallout from COVID-19 has had devastating impacts on the city's budget requiring across the board cuts, including at DSNY. But given the urgency of mitigating climate change in the most populous and diverse city in the nation, we cannot continue pouring money in traditional, into traditional trash collection practices while cutting funds for prevention, reuse, and recycling that will, in time and if fully supported, reduce the cost of long-term waste export to our city and ensure we no longer are complicit in the landfilling and incineration of waste time. and environmental right. justice is nationwide. Thank you. Thank you. Next will be Kate Peterson, followed by Katie Savage, followed by Claire Mifflin. Starting time. Hi, my name is Kate Peterson, and I've lived in Astoria, Queens for more than a decade. And I'm testifying today because I would like City Council to ensure that New York City has the sanitation services that they need by restoring the budget and by specifically restoring the budget to litter, bas litter basket collection service to at least the levels of fiscal year 2020. Um, as Chair Reynoso said today, a dirty city is a public health crisis in itself. In June of last year, I asked people in my neighborhood to join me. Um, we started emptying overflowing litter baskets in my neighborhood. And at that time, I thought that it would call attention to a problem that could be solved. As you might guess by that timeline, uh, it only grew worse in July with the major budget cuts. And uh, we really don't have a plan going into the next year. So we're going to be seeing the exact same thing. Um, the pandemic has changed human behavior. We're using our public spaces differently and assuming that we can follow a similar plan that we did before with an extremely reduced budget is uh, very short-sighted. Um, as a result of the conditions in our neighborhood for the past eight months, I've rallied volunteers. We spent over a thousand hours picking up litter off of our uh, public sidewalks, and we've had over 70 cleanups. Um, I wanna shout out to all of Astoria for being amazing and to come out during a pandemic and pick up trash. Um, however, this is not something that we should have to do in order to have sanitary living conditions. Um, throughout our work, I've also connected with many other litter cleanup groups across the city, some of whom are here today. And uh, I have really learned that the situation that we're facing now with these budget cuts is that we are exacerbating a state of inequity in sanitation. And if we continue with this path, we are going to have um, areas that have higher income will have cleaner streets and other areas will not. And that is not what we deserve for New York City. Um, so because I'm in a situation where I've been able to devote the time needed to this issue, I recognize that I have the privilege and I want to use my voice to advocate to make sure that services are being given to everybody in New York City, who um, everybody equally. Um, the last thing I wanted to bring up is that I'm concerned maybe the data is not being tracked properly in terms of what the actual conditions on our sidewalks is. Um, in August of last year, the sidewalks in my community district received a 100% approval rating from the mayor's scorecard system. Um, I don't know what sidewalks they visited, but I, yeah, I can't imagine how they got to 100%. If you looked in my apartment from outside a window, you might think it was 100% clean, but uh, once you get inside, it's very clearly not. So uh, I, would, I would urge city council to consider uh, whether the data is being captured properly. If it's not, to figure out how it could be captured properly, because if that's the data that we are relying on to create a budget, we are, um, we are not doing it accurately. Um, and the final thing I want to say is that if we continue last year in the same vein that we did, I we continue next year in the same vein we did this year, um, I'm concerned that people will not want to continue to live in what I consider the most amazing city in the world. And I'm concerned people will leave my neighborhood of Astoria, which is the best neighborhood in New York City. So thank you. Thank you. Next will be Katie Savage, followed by Claire Mifflin, followed by Henry Lee. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Katie Savage, and I'm the founder of the Hell's Kitchen Litter Legion, a volunteer community cleanup group started in June of 2020. Over the past eight months, we have hosted 30 group cleanups with over 275 participants and almost 100 unique volunteers. Together, we pick up litter and empty overflowing corner baskets, primarily along 10th Avenue and Hell's Kitchen. 
Due to the Department of Sanitation budget cuts, the litter baskets along this avenue are only empty once every two to three days. This may have been acceptable last spring during the lockdown when no one was outside, but once the weather warmed up, the excess trash started to appear. Last week alone, we picked up 325 pounds of loose litter along a 10 block stretch and emptied 40 overflowing corner baskets. As we start to enter spring again, we need the drastic service cuts to be restored more than ever. We cannot normalize seeing trash everywhere. This is not a job for volunteers. These are basic city services that must be restored. Also, in my 16 years as a New York City resident, I have never once encountered a syringe on the street until last spring. Just this week, I reported six syringes within three blocks, most of them by schools. Cleanup groups throughout the city are encountering these issues as well. As part of the FY21 budget cuts, the DSNY syringe collection unit was eliminated, and it now takes longer for these conditions to be addressed. In addition to restored funding for basket service and syringe collection by DSNY, I urge council members to restore full fiscal year 2020 funding levels for the NYC cleanup initiative that supports critical supplemental cleaning services throughout the city. It's not Department of Sanitation's job to clean the sidewalks, but we need those sidewalk spaces to be clean. Our businesses are struggling and providing support to keep our streets clean will make our city more attractive to the visitors we desperately need to help our economy rebound from the impacts of the pandemic. This amounts to a modest $5.1 million in funding that will provide an immediate impact on the cleanliness of our streets. These programs also provide jobs to formerly homeless and incarcerated individuals. So to me, this is a win-win, creating jobs and keeping our streets clean. I've participated in cleanups in Manhattan, Brooklyn, Queens, and the Bronx, and everywhere is dirty. We all see the same things and we don't deserve to live in these conditions. Um, it's, it's a huge issue and it really needs to be addressed. We have to have the basic city services. We have to have overflowing baskets emptied. I understand the need to educate and reduce the waste stream in general, but that doesn't mean we stop and let the city turn into a dumping ground. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next will be Claire Mifflin, followed by Henry Lee, followed by Leslie Woodruff. Time starts now. Hi, I'm Claire Mifflin, Center for Zero Waste Design and part of the Save Our Compost Coalition. I fully support the Save Our Compost funding request for 14.75 million to expand community composting and to pilot solutions to ensure all buildings can be set up for future successful curbside collection. When developing the zero waste design guidelines, we visited over 40 buildings and know that many of them would not be able to manage the brown organics bins. It's fine for well-resourced buildings, but many just don't have enough staff or space. Typically, trash is dropped into a chute, which feeds directly into a compactor and the black bags. Those bags are 40% full of organic waste. It's a lot. To collect it in small bins instead requires more labor and space. Many buildings have small unventilated waste rooms. Others don't have enough staff to move the bins to and from the curb. Could be 50 of them in a large building and keep them clean. It's time to spend a modest 2 million on pilots to determine the best way to set up all buildings for successful participation and to reduce costs for future curbside collection. Equipment can be installed in buildings that reduces the volume of organic waste by 90%, eliminates odors and produces an organic fertilizer. On-street containers could allow residents in, uh, in, in neighborhoods with no space at all to, and under-resourced buildings to drop off waste curbside. How these systems are best set up for high participation Patient, low contamination and easy management needs to be tested and evaluated in a pilot, but it's clear they could save substantial money for the buildings and the city. Food scraps are the most problematic part of the waste stream, bringing cockroaches, pest control chemicals and asthma to buildings, garbage, juice, rats and odors to streets and greenhouse gas emissions to landfills. Yet separated, they can bring huge benefits to the city, regenerating local soils, supporting urban agriculture and street trees, making the city cooler and reducing flooding. This can be done in so many ways, all require different amounts of space and labor with community and volunteer involvement or using in-building equipment. So I fully support expanding community composting, but we also need pilots so when the city restarts organic collection and makes it mandatory, 
it will be successful, equitable, and affordable. We need to ensure that all New Yorkers can participate in making their city greener, cleaner, and more sustainable. 14.75 million is not a lot, but it could have a catalytic effect, setting New York City up for zero waste success and creating a whole host of other benefits. Thank you all for your time and consideration. Thank you. Next will be Henry Lee, followed by Leslie Woodruff, followed by Jane Selden. Time starts now. Hey everyone, I'm Henry Lee. I live uh, on the 900, 700 block of Ninth Avenue here in Hell's Kitchen. And I just wanted to tell you over the last year what I've seen and experienced. And this, as some people have said, it really is a quality of, of life issue here in the city. It's about the health and safety for everyone. And it's my belief that people are going to leave the city if it's not going to be livable. And this is what I've seen. I've seen lots of household trash dumped on Ninth Avenue between the avenue itself and the bike lane where the bins are meant to be. They're, they are over, have been overflowing. A couple of weeks ago, I saw someone had renovated their apartment or moved and all their garbage got dumped out on the corner, on the sidewalk. It sat there for two weeks. And I know this is the case because there was a very nice Mila uh, dishwasher that was left in the garbage and we commented on it several, several times. I also have seen syringes in the streets, which was shocking to me. I saw people actually over the summer using drugs in the streets. Uh, this is, this is to me, is a very serious issue. I love New York, uh, but I was really shocked at how bad things have gotten. Uh, as you know, I actually met Katie Savage uh, last year, and I've tried to help her a little bit. Uh, she's done an amazing job. Uh, but I think we all can agree that we definitely want our city to be livable because I, you know, I put a little note here. How does the mayor expect to restart the tourist economy uh, if this is a disgusting and dirty city? Uh, anyway, thanks for letting me speak. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Leslie Woodruff, followed by Jean Salden, followed by Josh Tatum. Time starts now. Hi everyone, Leslie Woodruff here. I live in Hell's Kitchen um, and I'm coming to you from a family perspective. I run a small group um, of parents and um, family members uh, called Hell's Kitchen Family. And last year was really tough for all of the families in the neighborhood when our kids were picking up, um, excuse me, our kids were actually picking up syringes. That's just something that goes beyond it anything I ever expected uh, being a parent. Um, I love composting. We are big fans, but we need to get down to the basics and get back to the basics. We need our budget from last year restored so that we can have proper pickups. The waste cans on the corner that are overflowing constantly, um, the litter begets litter, right? So the can's overflowing. So sometimes, you know, we're lucky enough that We've got um, Hell's Kitchen Litter Legion in the neighborhood and Katie Savage and her team of volunteers who we participate with the Litter Legion as well um, will bag up all the waste and set it there for collection so that the garbage can itself is not overflowing. Unfortunately, people just see those bags on the sidewalk sitting there for sometimes weeks at a time until they get picked up. And that litter, that bag begets more litter because people just toss their garbage or their syringes or there's human feces. I mean, the things that we see out on the sidewalks these days are really shocking and families are just fed up with it. We are not going to continue living in New York City and paying premium prices to live here and, you know, it's an amazing city, but it's not just about litter is ugly to look at. It's now unsafe. I can't even take my child out without her finding something really horrifying on the street. Um, we're adjacent to Times Square, the theater and tourist district. This is you know, a heavily trafficked area in Midtown where we need to have empty garbage cans. Um, we need to have safe streets that aren't you know, cluttered up with gutter litter. Um, this is to me, this is about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I could talk about composting as well, but until our garbage situation 
is taken care of. I, I can't talk about something that's more actualized. I need the basic services right now restored. Thank you so much. I really hope that this will be a high priority. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Jane Selden, followed by Josh Caden, followed by Ina Lee Selden. Time starts now. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony for this hearing. My name is Jane Selden, and I represent the local climate group 350 NYC. We are testifying today about refrigerants, powerful greenhouse gases that are thousands of times more destructive than CO2. Refrigerants in use now are mostly hydrofluorocarbons or HFCs, and in some older equipment, chlorofluorocarbons or CFCs, often known as Freon. They are found in refrigerators, air conditioners, dehumidifiers, and a host of other machines. If these refrigerants are not recovered before disposal, they leak into the atmosphere, contributing significantly to extreme climate damage. The DEC estimates that emissions from HFCs in New York City make up 6% of greenhouse gas emissions, equivalent to 4 million tons of CO2. 70% come from large commercial air conditioners and stationary refrigeration systems. Over half of these emissions occur at the point of disposal <clears throat> due to trash haulers not following correct recovery and disposal protocols. Inquiries to DSNY in the past reveal that there has been little or no monitoring of commercial haulers regarding recovery and disposal of large refrigerators and air conditioning systems. The good news is that we now have an opportunity to change this. With the introduction of the new commercial waste zone legislation, we recommend that first that uh, commercial haulers uh, awarded contracts with the city be required to be trained in safe recovery and disposal of large refrigerant systems and gases. Secondly, the, that the DSNY establish a database for monitoring large systems collected by commercial haulers and that the amount of HFC and CFC gases collected be tracked. In December of 2020, Congress passed the American Innovation and Manufacturing Act which gave the EPA authority to rewrite refrigerant management regulations. These are now in the process of being finalized by the Biden EPA. We urge the DSNY to establish an office of refrigerant recovery with adequate capacity to oversee and enforce refrigerant management, recovery, disposal, and monitoring of both commercial haulers and residential collection. We believe that if New York City is to reach its stated climate goal, it is crucial that adequate funding be included in the Department of Sanitation of New York's budget to hire personnel to ensure enforcement, recovery, disposal, and monitoring of HFCs and CFCs. Thank you. Thank you. Next will be Josh Tayden, followed by Ina Lee Salden, followed by Travis Tinney. Time starts now. Hi there, my name is Joshua Chaden. I'm an 18 year resident of Astoria here in Council District 22. I'm submitting testimony as a concerned citizen and volunteer for the Proud Historian organization, which Kate Peterson, who's also here at the uh, hearing today, um, organized for us back in June. We're calling for a full restoration of litter basket collection services to at least the fiscal year 20 level in the mayor's proposed budget for fiscal year 22. Uh, like the rest of the city, Astoria has experienced a noticeable and serious increase in the amount of trash on our sidewalks, on our streets, curbsides, and in our public spaces. Groups like Grow NYC, Save Our Compost Coalition, um, Hell's Kitchen Litter Legion, Astoria Park Alliance, and us with uh, Proud Astorian have all organized and improved sanitation and environmental conditions. But like Kate said earlier, it shouldn't be contingent upon uh, residents of New York City's and these volunteer organizations to pull weight that the city and Department of Sanitation should be uh, pulling themselves. You know, while this has benefited our neighborhoods morale, we've met strangers, we've become friends. Uh, it's enabled us to become allies in our efforts to beautify and clean up our streets. It demonstrates a serious and immediate need for an increase in the city funding and resources. Uh, 
Kate mentioned, you know, the number of volunteer hours we put in, it's over 1,250 people have volunteered. I myself lead a group over at Dittmar's Boulevard. One thing that I would like to echo is Katie Savage's uh, call along with her members, Henry and Leslie, to reinstate the dedicated DSNY uh, syringe co collection unit. Uh, that funding being stripped was really short-sighted. Like Le Leslie met, mentioned, it's a serious problem. We've got a lot of kiddos that are in parks finding syringes. We actually, at Proud Historian, have these sharps boxes that we've uh, been allocated. This is a great thing for us to have, but not every New Yorker is lucky enough to carry one of these safe boxes. This one's empty right now, so don't worry. Um, we picked up numerous syringes every weekend on streets that you would never before think would have these materials. And it's not just uh, medical waste, it's construction waste. Uh, another one of the members on this call mentioned that as well. Um, you know, objects like hypodermic needles, broken glass, metal objects have all been found on our streets and at the sanitation department were given proper levels. Uh, budget funding, they'd be removed in a safely uh, and more timely fashion. Um, one thing I would also say uh, is that, um, you know, building alliances with other community organizations, our elected officials, small business owners, and like-minded residents um, is really I, great. I, but we want to see our neighborhoods clean and encourage mutual respect for our public spaces. Thank you. Thank you. Next will be Ina Lee Salden, followed by Travis Tinney, followed by Peter Moses. Time starts now. You might need to accept the on mute. Something should pop up. Okay, I'm, I'm here to advocate for my little street. It's 52nd Street between 8th and 9th Avenue. I um, would like to propose a solution for my street that could be applied to the entire city with a 55 cent stamp, an envelope, and a letter from the Department of Sanitation or the city agency that is responsible for reminding small business owners that they are responsible for cleaning up their, their sidewalks and their curbs 18 inches into the street. That is my understanding of the rule. I learned that by walking 52nd Street between 8th and 9th with Steve Belinda and Jesse Bodine. We talked to business owners and we said, we, we reminded them that they are responsible for their curb and the street in front of their business and they complied graciously and consistently to this day. This is a simple thing. The businesses did not seem to be aware that that was their responsibility. And uh, the two holdouts, the big holdouts on our street um, are the United States Post Office, which is a disgrace, and the Hampton Inn, which is also a disgrace. Um, and I'd like to put in uh, support for smaller vehicles to clean up the streets. If they can do it in Paris, they can do it here. Um, the curb here is encrusted with dirt. The, at the end of the street, we get um, community, community, a, an accumulation of water which freezes, which means that the bike lane at the end of the street is usually frozen over, garbage collects, and the uh, the, the cyclers and the delivery staff from the restaurants um, avoid that lane, the bike lane. They veer into the traffic, and this is a this is a white bicycle waiting to happen. One of these bicyclists is going to get killed by a truck or by a car, not expecting them to move out of the bike lane between cars and into the traffic lane, and the city does not need another death of a bicycler. So it's an urgent problem. It doesn't take 1.5 million or $5 million to, uh, to correct. It just takes a polite reminder backed up by fines if people don't comply to clean their streets. Uh, 
That's it. Easy, low cost, fast. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Next will be Travis Tinney, followed by Peter Moses, followed by Rebecca Dengrove. Time starts now. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you to the council uh, for holding this hearing, Chairman Reynoso, uh, Council Member Shin, and the, and the other council members who have spoken today in support of funding for uh, the New York City uh, Sanitation Department and sanitation in general. My name is Travis Tinney. I'm testifying on behalf of ACE programs for the homeless. ACE is a nonprofit. We do uh, workforce training for men and women who are overcoming homelessness. In addition to that training and job placement, we employ 75 men and women who have overcome homelessness. With um, We offer them full-time employment and benefits uh, through a sanitation initiative, uh, the NYC Cleanup Initiative. We've seen through this work the firsthand effects of the cut in sanitation funding. Uh, we're proud to work alongside them, clean up the sidewalks and prepare the, the uh, trash and trash bins for that pickup. And in the months to come, we anticipate along with some of these uh, community organizations an uptick in trash there. So we call for uh, restoration to previous year's levels of funding, uh, FY20 level uh, sanitation funding and beyond, and as well for the New York City Cleanup Initiative funding. Um, we join in the, in the chorus to call for those. Thank you to the council uh, for making this a priority. It's important to the residents. We've had a severe uptick in, in complaints for this and uh, complaints of rodents, quality of life and safety hazards. So we are very pleased to see that the council is uh, moving forward to make calls for this. We're just appreciative of their general uh, mindset and demeanor to be in support of, of these sanitation issues that affect so many of us uh, New Yorkers. So thank you for your time. And uh, we, we advocate for restored funding. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Peter Moses, followed by Rebecca Dengrove, followed by Nora Bisharat. I'm first now. Hi, uh, my name is Peter Moses. I am a Astoria resident, not as long-term as some others. I've only been here 16 years. I'm also a small business owner. I'm one of the owners of Mighty Oak Roasters. And I just wanted to comment um, about the litter baskets, um, just walking around in my neighborhood, which I love, I've been here for a long time. Uh, it's just disgustingly filthy uh, everywhere you go. Um, and you know, while I know the group of Proud Historians does a lot of cleanup, uh, it really shouldn't fall on to us for that. Um, I, other than other people, I would like the funding to be increased over the 2020 levels. I don't think those will be sufficient uh, with the number of people who are still working from home all the time, not traveling. Um, and I think that those trash levels will increase on the streets. I'd also like to call out um, the e-waste program. Uh, right now you can't recycle your electronics. Um, the, if you look in the DSNY website, it tells you to um, you know, schedule an appointment, but then you look at that, you can't, appointments are not accepted right now due to COVID. It says to look at retailers. If you've ever tried to navigate Best Buy's website or Staples, uh, you'll see there's a lot of caveats on uh, recycling electronics. Um, I'm also, instructed to go to the DEC website, which then tells me to learn about ice fishing. So I'd really like to see those uh, the e-waste pickups uh, come back. It has been very helpful over the years. Um, I'd also like to um, see the orange DSNY um, reusable bags distributed to local businesses as a point for distributing out to the general public. I know I've picked some up at some tree waste shredding uh, before Christmas tree shredding, shredding, and that was really helpful. Um, and I think that's it, you know, I, I just beyond the waste baskets, um, I'd like to be able to be easier to get additional waste baskets in areas that need them. I've, you know, submitted a request multiple times for outside my business and on the avenue that I'm on, uh, to no avail prior to the pandemic. Um, so it would be very helpful if we could increase that. And I just want to say thanks to Chair Reynoso and, um, too bad, uh, Commissioner Grayson left. Uh, he is my wife's favorite commissioner. So she was excited to hear me speak to him. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next will be Rebecca Dengrove, followed by Jesse Bodine. Time starts now. Hi, my name is Rebecca Dengrove. Um, I'm here also as a resident of Astoria. Um, and 
I just wanted to reiterate some of the points that have already been said, emphasizing the need for curbside, curbside organics collection. I think that's incredibly important, as well as the, the increase of um, litter, bas the, the waste basket, litter removal, and issues around waste just collecting around the city and um, the importance of you know, all of these issues, the refrigerants is incredibly important. I mean, we're facing a climate crisis and the urgency just doesn't seem to be there. And the budget doesn't seem to reflect the, the necessity around the issue. And all of the things that I think have been mentioned um, are extremely critical waste management issues that all will support the city achieving its net zero goals. Um, and it's just incredibly important this yeah, I think it's a the, restoring the budget to at least the pre 2020 issue uh, levels so that we have the funds to support proper waste management, waste collection, and and just really, really emphasizing the need for um, organic curbside waste collection. Um, composting is incredibly important. It will help divert waste from going to landfills and, you know, reduce methane emissions. And it's just something that I think a lot of people can get behind and understand and putting the resources in place for the community to participate will just make it that much easier. And so um, it, it just blows my mind that we don't have the budget to support it. So I, I really hope that the 14.75 million that has been mentioned um, is considered and strongly, you know, implemented. Um, I just don't know what else to say. It's it's disappointing and frustrating. So thank you. I uh, appreciate the time. Thank you. At this time, we've called on everyone who's signed up to testify. If we've inadvertently missed you um, and you've signed up to testify, can you please use the Zoom raise hand function now? Okay, I'm not seeing anyone. So, Council Member Reynoso? Yes. Oh, hold on one second. There's. Okay. Hold on one minute. Hello, hello, hi. Hi, can you please say your name? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I am Dexter Thomas Payne. I'm here for Jennifer Seda. Uh, we are co-founders of the Anti-Litter Project. Okay, great. You can proceed with your testimony. Thank you very much. Uh, nice to be here. Thank you everybody uh, for speaking. Uh, we first started this initiative in June of 2020. And uh, as they said before, uh, the pandemic was one thing, but once it got nice, uh, we really saw the impact that people being outside had on the streets. We tried to reduce the litter uh, by line, that lines the streets by organizing weekly community cleanups. Uh, it was hard at first. We didn't get a lot of volunteers. We've been building traction slowly but surely. We, mo we work primarily in the South Bronx, which has been one of the underserved areas of the Bronx for a long time. Uh, last week, for example, we picked up 300 pounds of garbage in a one block radius. We have racked up over 500 volunteer hours and have 20 volunteers versus the population of the Bronx. Uh, we hear a lot of things in the street, like you guys are crazy, you should be getting paid for this. And we understand that it's a quality of life issue that affects all of us. And it's unfortunate that it falls on the residents to now do something about it. The budget cuts to DSNY are just downright unfair. There's a lot of other things that they can take funding from. And uh, we feel like a lot of other people do. The syringes are out of control. The trash is out of control. We need to allocate funding back to DSNY to give them the help they need. Uh, the camaraderie that we built and through the volunteer stuff has been really incredible, to say the least. I've lived in New York City my whole life, and I've never seen people come together like this. But um, what we're doing is putting a Band-Aid over a gash at the moment, and it hurts to say that. And I want to continue working on cleaning the city, but I think the city has to help us too. So we feel the same way. We demand that the city does something to help us fix this problem, because if they want to keep it this way, no one's going to want to stay here. Uh, this job has become a full-time internship. I call it a job, and it's not really a job. It's something that we take passionately here in the South Bronx. 
And we want to continue to clean the streets and show people that the health and hygiene is important no matter where you live. So on short, fun sanitation, and let's do it together. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes public testimony, Chair Inoso. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you everyone for uh, being here today. Um, I think that, you know, I hope that the administration and the Department of Sanitation have heard our voices and understand how deeply we care about clean streets um, and just initiatives that we should be paying attention to um, that are gonna address climate change um, as well. Uh, thank you for everyone that, you know, hung on there until the end. Um, and at this point, I'm going to adjourn the meeting.